Oh, was that Testing, you? testing. Did you hear that? Uh, sorry, I thought you were giving me a go to stop blushing. I just stopped blushing. <laughs> <laughs> We will uh, launch into a kind of informal bit where you guys can all network over uh, some you know, tea and coffee and cake and hopefully make some amazing collaborations to put in some fantastic applications. So um, so uh, no pressure. So there we go. Uh, okay, so I'll start by just uh, talking through the challenge and the call process. Um, okay, uh, where to stand? Okay. Um, yeah, so what is it? Um, the, read yourself obviously but uh, the cancer innovation challenge is a project funded by the Scottish Funding Council and it's about how we can help Scotland to become a world leading carer for people with cancer um, and it's a collaboration between three innovation centers and I think things are okay yep yep <laughs> the data lab um, and it's in collaboration with the Digital Health and Care Institute and uh, Stratified Medicine Scotland um, so here are all the project partners we have on board at the moment as you see we have quite a lot of uh, people involved which is great because we're getting as many different perspectives as possible onto the challenge and we have representatives from quite a few of our partners here today um, so it has two major work streams um, one of which is an open innovation funding call to identify innovative cancer data science solutions. That's what you're here for today. Uh, our other work stream is about developing new tools for patient reported data. Uh, that funding call uh, was launched earlier this year and is well underway. We have five projects currently undertaking their phase one feasibility studies. Um, and then we have a program of activities surrounding work, uh, each work stream, including public engagement and workshops. We had a workshop about synthetic data yesterday. Uh, during the Festival Fringe, we had a show about uh, Dr. Data, the answer to cancer. Uh, so we have a variety of activities around the project. So this is the funding call you're here about today. Uh, we have up to uh, £425,000 in total available. We're using Innovate UK's SDRI framework. Um, IP stays with the project. That's one of the key uh, enablers of the framework. Um, you can apply as part of a collaboration or on your own uh, as an organization. It's a two-phased funding process. Phase one is uh, for feasibility studies. Um, up to five proposals will be awarded up to 35,000 pounds each for a three-month feasibility study. And phase two is a proof of concept uh, development evaluation prototyping stage and a total of 250,000 pounds is available for phase two for up for up to two proposals. Um, phase one is open to any organization registered in the EU and uh, phase two is only open to the up to five projects that were successful in phase one. <clears throat> There's five broad objectives to this funding call and uh, any proposal submitted should aim to achieve at least one of them. Uh, so there's enabling analysis of unstructured data, enabling data-driven clinical decisions, 
enabling data-driven service improvement in the NHS, enabling data-driven recruitment for clinical trials, and enabling the adoption of precision medicine approaches. So those, those are the five broad objectives. Um, and here's some important dates uh, for the funding process. Uh, you must register to apply by the 27th of October. Once you're registered, you'll be sent a link to all the competition documents, which includes the invitation to tender, uh, the sample contract that you will be uh, signing up to should you be successful, uh, and various other bits and pieces. Um, applications for phase one must be received by midnight 10th of November 2017. This is the timeline for the uh, funding call. So the call opened 8th of September. Today is obviously the information session and registration interest deadline, 27th October, call closes 10th of November. On the 16th of November, we will have a group that will do an eligi uh, eligibility <coughs> and scope sweep to ensure that all applications are eligible to apply. Uh, we have, in our previous call, we had uh, applications from companies outside the EU. They were obviously not eligible to apply, so they couldn't proceed. Um, and also to check that it's within the competition scope. Um, so once we've done that sweep, then all the successful projects at that point will proceed to a full review. Uh, the application review process will take place between the 17th of November and the 5th of January. Uh, and then we'll have a moderation panel on the 9th of January. And then our strategic management board will review a shortlist put forward by the moderation panel uh, and make their decisions on the uh, up to five projects on the 18th of January. Uh, you'll be notified very shortly after that meeting and then we'll start the contracting process uh, with the expected feasibility study date as uh, start date of the 1st of March 2018. Um, now we say three months from then is the end of your phase one and then you'll be expected to submit an end of phase report and your application for phase two um, which will then be reviewed by the strategic management board and uh, your phase two will start July 2018 six months on to January 2019, and then we will expect the final uh, presentations on what the final one to two projects got up to in February 2019. So just to give you a bit more information about the review process, um, each proposal will be reviewed and scored by five different assessors. Uh, someone from a clinical perspective, a data science perspective, a data handling perspective, a business development, and a citizen. Uh, so we have five reviewers looking at each application uh, and giving a score well, on the same assessment criteria that has been made available in the invitation to tender document. Uh, and then a moderation panel will moderate the scores and uh, present the top, say, 10 shortlist to the strategic management board. And then the strategic management board will review the shortlist and make the final funding decisions. Uh, they may apply a strategic and portfolio approach uh, to enable distribution of projects across the five objectives. Um, so that we don't award five projects for one objective. Um, phase two, uh, assessment criteria will be made available uh, near the end of phase one when you apply for phase two. Uh, and then each project has to attend an interview, a pitch uh, to the strategic management board. Data access and information governance, you hear uh, more uh, today uh, from over there, but uh, there's a guide to accessing NHS data available on the competition brief. Uh, like I said, there will uh, be more information on the process later on today. Uh, and each feasibility study project is expected to incorporate the information governance process in their phase one plan uh, and the associated costs. And, um, and then we have representatives from the Scottish Cancer Registry here if you have any questions about that as well. Um, and also, any proposed solution will need to be compatible with or integrate with the Scottish e-health infrastructure. And we have, uh, we'll hear more from Joanne, uh, who's here from the e-health team. Project end. Uh, so at the end of phase two, we ask the successful project to present their work. So it'll be a final project, uh, formal project report, a final presentation pitch to the strategic management board and invited stakeholders, i.e. potential routes to market, and a final presentation pitch to a public audience. Um, Projects that do not progress from phase one to phase two, we're gonna try and set up a collider event uh, to uh, expose the companies to alternative routes to market uh, so that the momentum isn't lost from the work done in phase one. Citizen involvement. Uh, we would expect each project to involve an element of citizen involvement either through surveys or citizen panels or other means. Um, 
we can help potential applicants by putting them in touch with contacts such as the Alliance, CRUK, understanding patient data, etc. Uh, we'll have Barry, Murray, Barry, <laughs> speak, uh, speak on public attitudes. Um, sorry, Barry, just to let you know, we, we kind of swapped you around with Steve, if that's okay. <laughs> um, okay. Any questions? Brilliant. Excellent. Uh, okay, and I will now. Uh, <coughs> thank you, and I will now <coughs> pass on to Hillary, who will give us a clinical overview. And I perhaps if I give you the mic. So far, the technology is working. <laughs> we'll see. No pressure. There. Yeah. Oh, the no. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> it says Microsoft PowerPoint has failed on my laptop. <laughs> okay, well, you try moving forward to see if it works. Mm. Uh, oh. Technology has failed. Do apologize. Um, let's try again. Um, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. While we're trying to sort out the technology, <coughs> I just uh, introduce myself. My name is Hilary Dawson, and my title at the moment is Deputy Director of the Innovative Healthcare Delivery Programme. Quite snappy, isn't it? Mm. Um, just tell you a little bit about my background. I'm a medical doctor, I'm a radiologist who specialises in breast cancer. Um, I have additional portfolios, uh, which laterally, before I left the NHS in November, um, I was lead cancer clinician for the West of Scotland. So actually core to my clinical activity was working at a national level uh, in the development and the rollout of cancer standards and then how we would use that in clinical practice to drive up improvements in clinical care. Um, so in December I made the transition more to be seconded to Scottish Government so that more of my time is dealing with um, cancer, uh, initially cancer, but going beyond cancer into standards and so on. It's not just about the collection of data, more importantly it's using data to actually make changes. So what my task today is just to put a clinical context to this whole um, very exciting and innovative approach to trying to and um, you know, crack the nut of accessing all this data. And I apologise if this is familiar to you, but I am aware of the fact that many of you are out with the healthcare sector, so I thought I would just briefly give you a kind of strategic setting to how we plan and manage cancer services in Scotland. And so the strategy is all, always dictated at Scottish Government level. There are a number of important documents that actually are shaping the way we deliver our cancer services. Um, many years ago we had our first breast cancer, uh, our Better Cancer <coughs> Care Action Plan, our cancer strategy, which was updated in 2016 into beating cancer and mission and action. And actually included in that was making much better use of our data. Um, and that has turned into a work stream. Um, Scottish Government is actually funding the Innovative Healthcare Delivery Programme to see if we can actually, in a much more agile way, um, access and use our data. The way it operates is with the strategic direction set at government level and we have a Scottish Cancer Task Force which then sets uh, out the work streams and importantly for this we have four main work streams, this is detect cancer <coughs> early to try and improve um, the public's <coughs> awareness about presenting earlier with symptoms and um, we've got transforming care after cancer treatment, in other words trying to revolutionise the way we follow up patients after they finish their treatment there is a work stream looking at innovative radiotherapy techniques. But where I come in is I chair the National Quality Group. And the main focus of what we do is to identify um, measurable outcomes and also a framework in which we can discuss these outcomes of clinical care. The actual delivery of cancer services, <coughs> however, is really very much the domain of the health boards. And in Scotland, we have 14 territorial health boards. But behind all that, we also have quite a network of regional working. We have three regional cancer networks, um, three regional cancer networks. And they're interesting because they're not in charge in any way of running services. They don't employ staff, they don't have budgets to run services. But what they do is they provide a platform for geographical areas to, to share uh, experience, share data, share outcomes. 
So there are three. There's one in the west, which covers half of Scotland. There's one in the east, and there's one in the north. And this gives a platform for everybody involved in clinical care to actually sit and share experiences to try and discuss variation and try and see where we can share good practice. And also along the way, we're going to identify areas where perhaps practice isn't as good and, and we can, in that kind of collegiate forum, we can actually share good ideas to improve performance. And actually unfettered by the kind of boundaries of money and running staff, we can generate some really important and meaningful discussions at that level. There are also three national cancer networks, and these are for um, cancers which are actually slightly more rare, um, where the numbers of cancers in the whole of Scotland are in the hundreds as opposed to the thousands, and therefore we actually share that collegiate approach on a national basis um, beyond regions. There is also one managed service network, and the difference between a clinical network and a service network is that the, the service network does all the things that the clinical network does, plus it does have some budget to actually deliver some operational aspects of care. We do that for our childhood, teenage, and young adult cancer, which totals in the whole of Scotland 300 cases. Now, within each of these regional cancer networks, we also have tumor specific networks, and these are for the more common cancers. So for example, breast, lung, upper GI, head, neck, gynecology, skin, colorectal urology, hematology. These are the ones where the numbers of cases in Scotland are in the thousands, and therefore it makes sense to discuss and share the learning on a regional basis. I mentioned that for those cancers that are slightly more rare, we have national networks. These are the CNS, uh, and brain tumors, hepatobilionary, sarcoma, and neuroendocrine tumors like thyroid and adrenal tumours. Each of these actual tumour specific networks have representation from all the relevant disciplines and all the relevant <coughs> geographical areas within the region and they sit on an advisory board. Why I share that with you is it's a great way to reach out into the communities of where these patients are sitting. You can, through one um, source, you can reach all the geographical areas and all the disciplines, be it the radiologists, the pathologists, the surgeons, etc., the nursing staff, all of the people who are involved in managing the cancers. We also, importantly, include patients on these advisory boards. So what's the problem? What we're looking at here is um, mortality rates per 100,000 population, and we're comparing um, populations in the whole of the United Kingdom and EU but also Scotland separated out uh, from the United Kingdom. And when we pull these data together and look at them for the first time, it looks as if that the highest mortality rates, albeit that there is, it's sloping down, the highest mortality rates sit with us in Scotland. We are sitting above our counterparts in the United Kingdom, and e even then we're sitting above, and from the UK, above our counterparts in the EU. So it looks as if we have got a higher death rate from cancer in Scotland um, compared with our colleagues south of the border in the rest of the UK and in Europe. And so the Innovative Healthcare Delivery Programme was set up to try and, here's our mission statement, to harness and promote healthcare informatics to deliver value to patients, healthcare professionals and the NHS through collaboration with academia, industry and the third sector. We are not physically sited in the building in Scot the St Andrew's House, which is the heart of Scottish Government across the road. They physically sited us, our, our main base is in the uh, Bayer Quarter, and there we sit with other key professional bodies that contribute to this work, but also by, I think, taking us out of St Andrew's House, it emphasises that we're using an innovative approach to what we're doing. The I is the most important part in our title, and it's an innovative approach. We've been trying to crack this nut through traditional methods in Scotland for some time now, and we're not managing to achieve that. Maybe we'll have opportunities in the, in the panel discussion later on to maybe explore why. And so we're looking at an innovative way in the 21st century of trying to achieve this. I think the important message from this is we are, our first priority is to develop national cancer data infrastructure for Scotland 
which can link the large number of uh, very complex and heterogeneous data sets that are out there coming from primary care, secondary care, but also as we move to much closer towards integrating social care to improve our patients' outcomes. These are very large, complex data sets, as we'll hear, and what we're trying to do is to try and seamlessly tap into these um, much more timely, much more accurate, much more efficiently, so that we can actually get beyond the generation of the data and start talking about what they tell us about our services and use that to change the way we deliver. And along the way, we want improved outcomes as well. So we recognise that there's a great opportunity for NHS Scotland to build on all the recent developments which have been accrued from informatics, data analytics, digital health, genomics and stratified medicine. And in order to do this, we necessarily have to network with all these various groups and, and what knits it together is the IHDP. So we are an enabling uh, uh, organisation. We, we are not there to have a longevity of function. We're here in the short to medium term to try and facilitate and pull together all these elements that we see will contribute to this prize that we seek at the end of the day. So we are dealing with the fact that there is in existence multiple heterogeneous data sets. There are technical barriers, there are organi organizational barriers, and basically we come to this jun juncture unable to have delivered to date using traditional methods. So as we set up uh, and started to explore the nature of the problem and try and pursue, pursue um, solutions to it, you can see <coughs> the complexity of what we're faced with. Um, we started off marching around the five cancer centres in Scotland and just talking to staff to say, where are you now? What are you doing? What do you need, etc. And we built up this complex jigsaw, and out of this, we developed some work streams because the more we delve into this, the more the work just grew arms and legs. And so we've developed a number of work streams, um, but importantly, one of them, well, importantly, one of them was the Challenge Fund. As I say, in the spirit of innovation, we decided to go out to different procurement methodologies and tap into expertise way beyond the healthcare sector um, to try in an innovative way procure some solutions for us. So the aim of what we're doing, as I say, is not just to produce data. Um, it's more about joining up the data and providing that to clinical teams so they can actually get around the table and the discussion is, has a level of maturity which goes way beyond I don't believe the data to what do these data tell us about our patients and about our practice. So to give you a, an idea of the sort of data sets, these are just a number of the large data sets which um, are held right across uh, the whole of Scotland. We have data called QPI and I'm going to talk a bit about that. We have uh, data which reflect systemic anti-cancer therapy, basically chemotherapy and other variants that are used sy systemically. We have radiotherapy data. We have data from primary care in this uh, new data set called SPIRE, which has been rolled out. And there are other pockets of cancer data. And the idea is to collect these initially at national level and promote a discussion to, to discuss variation and learn from that. But the aim, and as I say, one of the aims on the document, you'll see the term precision medicine. This is because clinical practice is changing so that as we gather more and more data, which is more personalized to that particular person's cancer. So for example, if you have breast cancer, it won't just be you have breast cancer that is derived from the ducts and it's called ductal breast cancer, but you will have breast cancer <coughs> derived from the ducts but it will have this particular molecular makeup and that means that when we are managing patients with breast cancer in the future we are going to have to not just look at a cohort of patients that have ductal cancer to try and inform how we're going to treat the patient in front of us 
we're going to have to compare that patient who's going to have a particular molecular profile to her particular breast cancer with a much wider data set to try and get similar cases that will then inform our treatment. So we're trying to be much more precise in targeting treatments. In order to do that, we're going to have to access huge numbers of complex uh, and heterogeneous data sets. So as I say, let me just give you an example of what my life is like tonight, just, just now. And I'm going to talk about the QPI data. We live in a world which um, the government has moved the strategic focus not just to include waiting time targets, but they've also moved us into a world of quality targets, and that was the publication of our quality uh, standards. And as part of that, we developed a thing called the Quality Performance Indicator, called the QPI. Now, what is a QPI? Well, it's a, it is an actual or it's a proxy measure of the quality of care, and it indicates key aspects of safe and effective care. Critically, it's got to be outcome-focused, it's got to be evidence-based, and it's got to be measurable. Um, and the whole idea is that we will get a group of clinicians from the whole of Scotland, for, let's say we're looking at breast QPIs, all of whom have a particular specialist interest in breast, and we'll say to them, we want you to develop outcome-focused, evidence-based, measurable indicators that we are then going to agree on, roll out, and look at all the patients with breast cancer in Scotland against these quality performance indicators. Why are we going to do that? Because we want to measure, compare, identify variation, and take the best performers to pull up the poorest performance. In other words, to drive up um, improvements of care. We were quite prescriptive. We said, we want you to do this tumor by tumor. For each tumor type, we want just 10 to 14. Um, and we'll, do, we'll give you some help, we'll define uh, the, how you're going to measure them, and then we'll present the data back to you. To put that in context, before the development of QPIs, I as a clinician had to, for each breast cancer patient, had to actually complete a form where we gathered over 200 data points related to that breast cancer. What we've now said to the clinicians Yes, we used to gather 200 data items for cancer, but we only reported in 13 of them. So that's why we said we want you to limit, we have to roll up the sleeves. As a clinical group in the whole of Scotland, you have to agree what are the 10 or 14 important measurable outcomes uh, for your patients. Important to them, if we were going to run the reports, was how we were going to present the data back to them. And that's been done through the development of dashboards in Scotland, and there are a whole variety of dashboards um, which will give you some background demographics about overall survival, the distribution of cases, etc. But also, for each of our QPIs, so this is QPI 2, for example, we can present the data either at Scotland level, health board level, sorry, regional level, which is multiple health boards, health board level and unit level. And these data in this format are then given back to the individual clinical teams who can then look at their performance compared with the unit down the road, the health board in the other side of the country, and all Scotland. And the idea is that when you've got data that you believe in and that are credible, you will then have a discussion about, well, let's look at this particular health board here who seems to have a poorer performance in the preoperative assessment of whether or not the cancer spread to the armpit out with the breast. So can we take this board, who seems to be exceeding the target, and ask, say, what do you do differently from this board here? What's the reasons for that? So um, an example of how do we actually derive our QPIs? Having gone through the pain of agreeing them, how do we do it? Well. If you are diagnosed with breast cancer, you begin on a treatment pathway which will last 10 months. From surgery, this is a traditional pathway, surgery and radiotherapy and chemotherapy. So if we're going to report on our breast cancer QPIs, the current methodology is that we will collect a whole calendar year of data. So if you, every patient that's through the clinic door and diagnosed between the 1st of January and one year, and including that patient who comes through the door on the 31st of December, 
will be included in this cohort and which we'll report. So having decided we're going to measure these, we then have to wait a whole year to gather the clinical cohort together. Um, the treatment for that last patient through the door will not be completed until October of the following year. Um, we will then allow a six month gap to actually collect the data. All of the data informing this, this cohort all sits digitally, but no, no, we don't access it digitally. What we do is we then create a form and we get our nurses to take the data out of the digital uh, modality and handwrite it on a form, which is then given to somebody else who then inputs it into a data set which is created to gather these data. That takes six months to make sure that we've got all our thousands of patients in that year. We then run a report, which is usually about July of the following year, um, and there'll be missing data. We give the report back to our clinicians to say, check it, does this reflect your practice? They then fill in the gaps and tidy it up. And we then run another report, which is <coughs> October, a year after the last patient has completed her treatment. Thereafter, we have to look at the data, see where we're deficient, decide how we're going to improve our practice, create an action plan, and then actually, we then sit in a room, all the representatives from the whole of Scotland sit in one room and discuss the national picture. So, 10 month treatment pathway, um, for those patients who were diagnosed between the 1st of January and the 31st of December 2014, we had our national meeting in January of this year. And so the problem, the challenge we've got, having got the clinical community to agree, to agree um, the fact that we should be collecting these data, by the time we actually get in a room collectively to decide what they're telling us about it, um, clearly the data's out of date. And for those poor performers, their excuse is, we do things differently. So timeliness is a big challenge. Another challenge to us is with the SAC data, the systemic anti-cancer treatment. We, the government has invested a huge amount of money in rolling out a system to electronically prescribe and deliver our <coughs> food therapy. All this information, this richness of data sitting there, and millions of pounds have been sent rolling out. The challenge, however, is that they have rolled it out um, across this period here, Three year period, but it's, although it's been, we've gone about with a single system, we have five versions of this single system. And therefore, five <coughs> years later, we still do not have um, national reporting of the outputs of, of our, our investment here. And so, here's another challenge it's a technical challenge about how can we actually ask the same question to five versions of uh, the same system. So, what we're seeking from going about the Cancer Innovation Challenge with our cancer data is exactly what we've laid out here, a modern and innovative approach to data integration and access where the silos of data are integrated without moving or duplicating our data. Any solution that comes up must <coughs> add real value. We're not looking for sexy apps that we can put in people's phones that gives us the same information we have already. We're looking for something that's actually going to change the way we actually manage our patients. Are we looking for something that's going to aid clinical decision making? Are we going to look at using AI properly to change the way we as doctors and clinicians are actually dealing with our patients? Obviously, the solution has got to be compatible with our NHS Scotland systems and it's got to be scalable. And as a lead into a later presentation, the solution's got to be found within the current system of information governance. So that's a kind of romp through um, the background and the clinical context to what we're doing and some of the and worked examples of where we are just now. So I'm happy to take any questions, but I'll also be part of the panel later on. Would people like to ask questions now or would you like to hear all the presentations and then ask the questions at the end? Okay, that's absolutely fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> 
specialist health boards, okay, 228 hospital sites, I'm not going to read out everything in this in here, but 180 uh, GP sites throughout Scotland. We're also looking at uh, supporting dental community and other uh, kind of clinical um, uh, type data centres within there. So within our network for health within NHS Scotland, which we call the SWAN network, we have over 3,000 sites connected to it. So it's quite fast and very varied type of landscape we have here. So we're in the process at the moment of um, reviewing our e-health strategy. That comes to an end um, 20, the, this, at the end of this year. So we're moving into a world that is now, uh, rather than replacing the e-health strategy, we're moving to a more of a digital health and care strategy. Um, what we're looking for, our ambition for this strategy, is to look at more um, developing more person-centred approach and have a lot more citizen engagement, making sure that the patient is at the centre of our design for any kind of patient facing services. We aim to make better use of data, both in, in the health and in the social care set, um, settings. Um, and using that data as well, just put it for the decision support, for research and innovation as well. And we're looking to start developing digital ecosystems around individuals um, and we talk predominantly within uh, the care setting at home. So what does it look like uh, for the future? And, uh, um, you can all see this at the back. Is the light going on top? Well, where our strategy will concentrate on, first of all, up here, is that kind of the service user layer um, that, that's actually expanded since we get our focus has been in the past. Um, you know, we see our service users in the of the future being healthcare professionals, the citizens themselves, patients, social care practitioners that will be in, will be integrating with health and social care partnerships, other organisations like voluntary sector who are providing um, care, uh, offering these care services as well, and to the research researchers at, at the end as well, who are needing uh, data for research purposes. So we need to think differently about how we're actually presenting that information to the, the person consuming it. You know, they all have different needs, they all have different requirements for data. Um, the other part that we're going to be focusing on in our, our strategy moving forward is our interoperability layer, building on some of our integration engines that we have in place at the moment, looking at how we could use workflow better, how we can get better access to documentation that we have within our state. So predominantly we will have um, a lot of, um, we have the applications, information, infrastructure layer that will, will, will be there to support it. So just covering quickly the foundations of it, these are our cornerstone products that we have within eHealth in Scotland. Starting up at the top, our integration messaging tools, is predominantly used within Scotland, our, um, our ensemble is our integration layer of choice within Scotland. Sky Gateway, for example, is our referral system. Um, we have information summary data sets, um, which are emergency care record, our key information summary, um, and our clinical portal, which supports our electronic patient record and a view of the 14 key information items within a patient's record. Patient facing, facing platforms, we're in the process at the moment of running a proof of concept for a patient portal, um, and that's where we see quite a lot of these new innovative programs um, programs and um, devices and everything that are coming through our patient portal. 
our core operating systems for the room hospitals, we have our patient management system called Track Care. Um, we have predominantly two different IT, uh, GP IT systems, um, a national PACS and a, you know, some, some screening systems in there as well. Our data repositories, predominantly within NHS Scotland, is Sky Store. Roger touched on electronic um, care summary. Um, our CHI is our electronic patient, uh, master patient index, which we're in the process of um, upgrading at the moment. But we're in a unique position within Scotland that we do have a unique patient identifier for all patients within Scotland. Um, we have the infrastructure in place for intelligence and innovation, um, predominantly within uh, the FAR um, and Safe Havens. All NHS Scotland are on a secure network, our SWAN network. Um, we have um, a few local governments you know, providing um, assistance in the, the, the social care settings that are connected to SWAN as well. And other big players like education are on their SWAN network. Um, we'll touch on CHI as well in terms of our patient identity. I'll come on to that later. And we have a set of information governance structures and guidance. I'm sure Stuart's going to cover on something. I'm going to cover that one today. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> So interoperability, as I said, is going to be one of the key focuses on our digital health and care strategy um, that we're writing at the moment. We're going to see a move towards more international standards, so we'd like, we'd like to see a lot more development in the, um, for HL7, FIRE and IHE. These are predominantly healthcare standards, for people who've not worked in this, uh, with these standards before. We have at the moment, um, we're predominantly uh, using bespoke XML Sky, what we call Sky XML, to share information within NHS Scotland. So this is a it will be a significant change for us moving into more international standards. We're looking to develop some open APIs. Um, predominantly, um, we'll probably start with what's coming out of the GP records: you know, the medications, demographics, allergies, um, authentications, appointment bookings. We'll be working in a kind of whole nation's collaboration to help looking at um, how we can create open APIs to get access to that information within <coughs> these uh, GP systems. Um, but it'll be go by, what we'll do is that is initially, but we'll go beyond that and look to create new open APIs within our, digital, uh, within our patient portal environment. We're going to be using that more like a digital platform to help engage with suppliers to actually share um, information with the patients and with apps and devices. Um, we're also looking at term terminology services here, um, to mainly to look at you know, the issues with data, that we all have the same common language when we're talking about data, we all actually know what we're, um, what we're dealing with. Um, and we're, we're going to be changing some of our messaging approach, how we actually say, share data and move data around the system. So we mentioned about CHI. CHI is, again, just to recap, is our electronic master patient index. This is our unique identifier throughout Scotland. CHI has been in existence in NHS Scotland for over 20 years. It sits on a VME mainframe at the moment, um, and it's something that we, we need to, to try and replace. So it's, it's a very significant programme to work for us at the moment. So what we're doing, I mean, we're not just replacing our demographic where, here, where what we're doing is we are really restructuring how we're actually dealing with our patients and how we're actually getting access to patient information. So the, the, the master database will obviously hold the, the demographic information for every patient in Scotland, but it is a very powerful matching tool as well. So it not only will help us to match all the records throughout Scotland, but it will provide us, for example, the capability to match with social care records of the future. So we can potentially make, make, uh, get these uh, records linked together. Um, there's going to be a significant audit around this to make sure that we, we can track and, and see who accesses our demographic database and for what purpose. So CHI is going to be in our centre of what we will probably determine the future of um, our health information sharing gateway. This will be a set of tools that will help us actually move information around in the future. First of all, by um, having a unique identifier, being able to accurately say this is, this is a golden record for this patient or this individual, um, and we can actually then use that unique identifier to match a series of data sets and information about that individual. 
That will be linked very closely to our record locator service, which will be um, a capability that will help us then take the unique identifier and go and find documents or data about that patient and pull them together. So it'll be more of a case of we're not storing data, we're going away to find data and view data. Um, so it's a kind of slightly different approach um, to how we actually um, store data at, at the moment. So the Record Locator Service is going to provide us with a very powerful tool for joining up information in the future. All of this, this information is managed through our national integration platform, um, which, we call, which is Ensemble. And that's how we then communicate with the uh, line of business systems, the likes of Sky, Sky Store, which is our document storage database, track our PMS system, portal, and you know, our GP systems, EMS vision. So that's, that, that's the, kind, the core architecture for sharing information, moving information about that's coming in the, the very near future. The other um, significant piece of work that we're going to be um, putting into our digital health and care strategy is our patient portal. It's, um, we, we will call it probably more like a health and social care portal um, because it will be, for, it's not just for patients, it's for citizens who are looking to access services for health and social care. So um, at the moment we've established some principles around the design and development of our portal um, and we're developing a proof of concept at, um, as we speak. We, our intention here is to do this just once for Scotland and that every user, every, every citizen that is accessing the patient portal will have the same um, user experience no matter where they live. So key to doing that is things like the, the electronic patient record or the person held file, um, as we, it's also commonly termed, will have to be designed and we'll have to, to agree what that data set will look like in the future so that we have a consistent approach that every patient sees the same information that, uh, with respect to their care. Um, we're starting with a few simple services within the patient. First of all, some content that's relative uh, to somebody's um, care pathway. Um, so being able to access information about appointment bookings and maybe some, you know, a few uh, services like access to letters. Uh, and that's something that, you know, well, these are just something to prove the concept just now. We will build these services over time. My account um, is the, the authentication method of choice for NHS Scotland. Um, we've chosen my account predominantly because it's already within use within local government and it gives us that tool then you know, there's so many records already um, built up within the, the my account um, authentication site so we will be building on top of that as well. Everything that we've got in here, every access to information, all the open APIs that we're developing for this platform will be standards based um, and that's one of the pieces. So these are the key principles that we are developing in terms of patient portal. So this is what it looks like. This might be hard to see at the back, so I'll just give you a, a quick overview of what we're, we're dealing with here. So on this side here, this is uh, kind of the design um, base that we have for patient portal, for the health and social care portal. At the top there is the My Account service. That's live at the moment. You can go in and, and actually um, ask to, to create a My Account. Um, that, and a patient will ask, access the information via the health and social care portal website. That portal website will, will pull static content from NHS Inform, for example. So we have a consistent way of approaching and sharing information about um, people's care pathways from NHS Inform. <coughs> All information displayed back to the patient will be handled via fire uh, resources. Our platform, these are the technical services that we'll be developing in platform. Of course, first of all, the authentication um, that we, we will be building at the moment and sharing information with my account. Um, but we're also going to do the, you know, we, authentication and authorization can go hand in hand. But, uh, you, you know, you would then have the patient has to sign up to services on the, on the patient portal. Um, they have to manage their consent to share their information. Who is it the patient wants to share their information with? Um, a new concept for us with NHS um, as well is that we're enabling, via this platform, enabling the patient to make that decision about consent to share information. And I think that would be quite a very powerful tool within that platform. Everything will be audited in there as well. Um, and we will use a record location service to actually retrieve and manage uh, documents within there. There's a person held file 
aspect of the, um, the the platform as well. That is still yet to be defined. We'll probably initially just show things like medications and allergies. Um, these are some of the things that patients are most keen to see. Uh, they've already expressed an interest in seeing these kind of uh, that kind of data on their patient portal. Um, but we have a lot of work to do to actually define personal health file, the content of that, and making sure it's a consistent approach throughout Scotland. Um, it will communicate with the uh, information will be exchanged in both ways. We'll take information from the patient and take information out of the health systems back to display to the patient via fire resources here and our national integration engine ensemble here, our healthcare, Intersystems Healthcare Connect, will be the methodology that we will share and exchange information um, with the health boards. So we have out here 14 health boards, 32 health and social care partnerships, local authority um, and health partnerships. So what we need to do as part of that PH, uh, that personal health file part here is work with these 14 health boards, 32 local partnerships to define the content of that, that personal health file, get an agreed consistent approach to it so that we can share, extract information from the line of business systems via our integration engine to present back to the patient. So that's effectively what the, the first um, proof of concept for the health and social care <coughs> portal will look like. In time, there will be, there will be services up to the open APIs so that we can engage with mobile devices um, and apps, uh, any developer, working with developers to, to, to engage with apps. So some of the key messages we want to put across um, about the technical architecture within NHS Scotland is that our digital landscape is complex, as you can see there, you know, I'm, not, I'm sure you are engaged with health force at this point in time, it's highly distributed, it's not one organisation, but it's many, many health boards, as we've, as we've said already, have the same system, but they have implemented it in different ways, so therefore we don't have a consistent approach to how we hold and manage data, but what we're aiming to do is to standardise that electronic patient record throughout Scotland so that we can actually then have that consistent view of our information and our data. Our, if you're ever contacting the health boards or the local authorities, what you will find, predominantly in health leads, that they are under intense time and cost pressures at this point in time. Um, therefore, what they're looking for um, is that if they're going to invest in anything, the innovations need to add uh, need to add maximum value and minimum effort and cost to them and their resources. And if we're looking for solutions that bring a, a fresh approach to the problems. We're not just looking to extend our application, our app spaces, a base in, in here as well. And um, the key to what we have to do in terms of in, in design moving forward is this open standards piece. So it's uh, whatever we're doing with the information is device agnostic like platform. So these are the key messages from us at um, the e-health community today. So thank you very much for your time. I've left my oh, oops. <laughs> Sorry. Gone. It's fine. <laughs> it's just to ensure no one me. <laughs> so that, that's our, um, my name's obviously Joanne Nolan. Um, the, I think the, the contact for IHCP is Julie Falk there, so she, I think, is the first point of contact within the programme, but happy for you to um, contact me as well, or I'll take any questions. Can I just ask a question about your patient, uh, patient contact proof of concept? Are you trying to develop your own patient portal or are you using any third party provider for that proof of concept? Are you, did you say an identity provider? Uh, third party. Or third party. Is it a um, commercial provider or are you it's a commercial developing? At the moment, um, we are working with Atos um, to develop the, the patient plaque, the, the, the digital platform. Um, we see this as being, you know, um, more than just a portal. This is actually, you know, for um, for us to be able to interoperate with devices and apps in the future. So it's, it's for us as well than just displaying information. Um, so Atos, we thought, are um, in a unique place within NHS Scotland to actually help us build this. But that's just for the proof of concept. You know, once we've done the proof of concept, we and we're going forward into the next phase of the proof of portal program. We will be going through a procurement exercise to actually find uh, the supplier choice for the future. Thank you. Hi. Very quick question.
question just along the same lines. What sort of time scale for having something live? Something live? Yeah. Well, the, the proof of concept, we're actually hoping to be engaging with patients. Um, so we have a cohort, about 100 patients that we're working with to actually test the, 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 the uh, proof of concept. And that will happen between December and February. So what, but what we're, we're looking for there is after that is the start of the procurement exercise. So we potentially won't have a, a live patient portal available until 2019, 20, 2020. Okay, thank you very much, Joanne. Sorry, I don't know why it shows my background, <laughs> my desktop background. talking to the Tories about what Brexit means. <laughs> um, so uh, I think that the science and the, it yeah. Yeah. Um, the technology that you use is going to be really important in these projects, but if you can't get any data, if you can't get information governments to work, they're going to fail. So this stuff's really important. Um, I'm hoping that you won't end up like this. I'm sure some people will, because that seems to be the nature of information governance. But if you understand why it's the way it is, how the system works, and if you talk to us, we'll try and help you through it. So let's hope it becomes a positive experience. So some basics to start with. Um, it depends what kind of data you want, and it depends who the data controller is. So I like to think of it in this, in this, in this sort of continuum going through. So we've got uh, NHS patient records completely identifiable about the individual, moving through to the identified data. Then we might have a category of paternal data where it's it's still real data, but we've done record swapping or we've done something to make it safer. Um, and then up the other end, you probably have synthetic data. And the degree of risk to the privacy of the individual, and therefore the controls that are upon that data, vary as you work, work along this continuum. So the first question to ask is what kind of data do you want? Okay, so the easiest thing is obviously patient consent. If you can get patient consent, that's the easiest. Off you go, you're, you're, you're up and running. But Many of the things that we want to do, that's just not possible. We want to go back in time. We want to look at hundreds of thousands of records. It's just not possible. So you're then you're in the world of using non-consented data, and that's when um, we need to understand the processes. We've heard a bit about some of the data that exists in Scotland, but I just want to spend just a couple of minutes showing you some of the national data sets that exist. Now, the information governance and the structure of data in Scotland is very different to in England. So um, the stuff that you think you know about, where trusts work and things like that, <coughs> it's different. So Scotland um, has an organisation called National Services Scotland, and they hold these data sets. Um, I can talk through some of them. I guess the ones that you're most likely to use, the cancer registry, and some staff here from the cancer registry, uh, 47,000 uh, annual registrations in the cancer registry, and that follows people through their, through their treatment course. But this, uh, this one's probably quite interesting as well, prescribing, that's community prescribing data. Uh, we've got five, just over 5 million people in Scotland, and we've got 90 million prescriptions a year, so people have quite a lot of prescriptions, they're quite sick. Um, hospital admissions, uh, 1.4 annually. So all of these data sets uh, are available through National Services Scotland, uh, and they're all linked together by the kind of community health index numbers. So you can actually start to track people across the life course using these kind of data sets. There's another set of data sets that are held in primary care. Now, what becomes interesting in primary care is that the data controllers for primary care are the clinicians. Whereas up here you can apply at national level, down here you have to apply to the individual practitioners that hold the data. We are working on something called SPIRE that will bring that together, but as of today that, that isn't in existence. So when you go here, you potentially have got a lot of people to apply for to get access to the data. Then there's data that's held at hospital level um, that the health boards control, and the cold cut guardians within the health boards. Uh, so there's 14 of these uh, and these sorts of data sets are available there. 
They are working to get a clinical imaging data set uh, put together, but this is some way off, I would say, probably 18 months at least um, away at the moment. But there is one store of all of the clin clinical imaging in Scotland uh, that does exist. And then down here, we've also been working with these, and I don't know, it depends on the projects, but these are other national data sets, some uh, UK level, um, some Scottish level, uh, that are available and that are used uh, for research in Scotland quite commonly. Um, the team that I run, we've got about 400 projects on the books and about 100 um, live ones that are accessing data at the moment, so it is possible to do. So, what are the questions that you need to ask? As I've been saying, you need to know who's the data controller, and it's going to be one of these, probably. It's going to be a GP, a regional health board, a special health board, National Services Scotland, or another public sector organisation. And the first question is what will convince them to let you have access to the data? I'm going to explain how they think so that you can understand what questions to ask them and how to interact with them. The other thing that's really important to ask, timelines and processes. How do you make an application? How long will it take? What are the turnaround times? All things I'm sure people are very familiar with when they're trying to use these data. Okay, so what are the data controllers thinking? So the first thing that they'll, they'll have in their minds is it must be legal. They need to process the data in a legal way. And I'm going to say a little bit about the way we do this in Scotland around the Common Law of Confidentiality and the Data Protection Act. But there's also this issue, um, the status of their organisation and what they can and can't do in their organisation. So public sector bodies can do some things with data and some things they can't do with data. And that's important to understand. Um, they will also be interested in carrying public support. Uh, and that's because of the way that we interpret and use these bits of legislation. And I'll say a little teeny bit about that, not too much, because Barry's going to say a bit more about it afterwards. Uh, and they'll also be thinking, does it does this need an ethical, ethical uh, review? Does it need ethical approval? And I'll say a little bit about that. Right, so common law uh, confidentiality, as you know, it's not a statute that's built up through case law. But the basic principle is that if you give information in a situation where you believe that there's a duty of confidence, then it shouldn't be disclosed. This is the one that the NHS lawyers worry about most. In 2002, we took a decision that it could be used under certain circumstances. It's never been tested in court, so they're a little bit nervous about this. So the exemptions to this common law of confidentiality are you've got consent, that's fine. Um, coming down here, where there's a legal duty to disclose it. And in England, they've created something called Section 251, which I said a little bit about, that doesn't apply in Scotland, so don't come ask for Section 251 clearance, because it just doesn't apply. So the one that they use in Scotland is this one. Disclosure necessary to safeguard individual or others, or in the public interest, and it's this one, primarily. So you have to argue that the study is in the public interest in order to meet this legal requirement. As I say, in England, there's Section 251, and um, that allows the Secretary of State for Health to set aside the common law of confidentiality. That's what we're doing. We're saying, I have the power of Secretary of State, uh, and that's administered um, through NHS Digital, and the uh, Health Research Authority um, can do that. It doesn't apply to Scotland, but if you're using English data, that's a, uh, a good way to do it. Okay, so then, after you've got through the common law of confidentiality, the other things in the data controller's minds is, uh, the Data Protection Act and Schedule 2, and because it's sensitive data, Schedule 3 as well. So you need to have a justification here. So here, these are the various things that you can choose, and again, what's important here is that this is the one that's normally used for the kinds of work that we're talking about. And here, um, functions of public nature exercised in the public interest. So again, the public interest is really key. And all the applications for accessing data ask you, what is the public benefit? What is the public interest? The other thing that's in here, necessary for the purpose of legitimate interest of the data controller, and that's why I said it's important what the statute is of the organisation that holds the data, whether they can do it or not, because it has to be within their um, legitimate interest. Their purposes. Okay. Then we've got Schedule 3, and you'll be getting the idea by now that the part that's used to justify for just Schedule 3 justification of the Data Protection Act, again, public nature exercised in the public of interest by any person. Right. So, the application forms for the data controllers in order to meet their uh, requirements under the law require that there's a demonstration of public interest. And then Scotland has a way of trying to work out whether there's a public interest or not in the piece of work that's being proposed. But that's why it's like that. 
Next time they're asking me what's the part of the interest you know of trying to meet this criteria. Okay, so some people that are familiar with this will say, ah, oh, yeah, but you've got Section 33 of the Data Protection Act, which actually lets you set aside um, Sections 2 and Section 3. And it's true, um, for statistical purposes, you can do that. But this is what's interesting in this context. If you're using Section 33, it mustn't do these things. Support measures and decisions in respect to particular individuals that can't be used for treatment if you're using Section 33. And it mustn't be done in a way that causes substantial damage or distress of other people that would do that. But that one, if you're talking about something which um, has clinical implications, is difficult to justify that kind of research exemption. So, good news. In Scotland, 14 health boards um, through eHealth, they've come together and they've created something called the Public Benefit and Privacy Panel. And what it tries to do is assess the applications that are being made to use non-consented data. And it's doing two things, it's balancing the privacy risk to the individuals against the public benefit of doing the research. This is really helpful website, if you go here it's got the application forms and more information about it. Okay, so how does the public benefit and privacy panel work? The first thing that we put in place is something called Idris. Um, I run this team, so anything I say about this now should be taken with a pinch of salt. It's a really great team. <laughs> uh, uh, eData e Research and Innovation Service. So it's been put there to help guide you through those processes that I was just describing. No application can go to the Public Benefit and Privacy Panel unless we've had a look at it. And the reason we did that was because the applications are going in half filled in and they were coming back and there was all sorts of questions being asked and people didn't really know what to put in the boxes and it all got a bit complicated. So we put this team in place, um, there's 20 of us, and we help you with that. So we know the stuff that I've just been telling you about and we will help you to fill in the form, make sure it's complete, quality sure before it goes to the Public Benefit and Privacy Panel. The Public Benefit and Privacy Panel has two tiers, tier one and tier two. Tier 1 meets on a fortnightly basis and it's made up of people from the territorial health boards, information governance experts, Coldicott guardians, uh, and some people from National Services Scotland that review those applications and they meet fortnightly. It's common for them to ask questions and to go back. Um, but 70% of the projects get through within a month um, and they go through at Tier 1. <coughs> Where Tier 1 can't agree, it's escalated to Tier 2, and the first stage of that is uh, not a sitting committee, but an emailed round discussion. Um, they have two weeks to turn that around. Uh, again, sometimes questions are asked and it pings back as and forwards a bit. Uh, and then finally, if they can't decide that, it comes to the full quarterly sitting committee where people are invited to come along and to talk about their application. Um, that's, that's pretty rare. We do a couple of those every quarter. So most of the applications are going through. I think it's 100 20 applications last year. So the public benefit and privacy panel is important if you're using non-consented data. It has delegated responsibility from the chief executives of the 14 health boards to make decisions when there's either national data involved or data that's used across multiple health boards, more than one health board. If it's single health board, then the cold cut guardian within the board can uh, sign off and provide data. Okay, ethics. Um, We've made a generic application <coughs> to the Ethics Committee to try and reduce the volume that was going around. And if these conditions are met, then normally ethical approval isn't required. So if the project's being peer-reviewed, so we know it's good science, if it's accessing data in the National Safe Haven, which I'll say something about in a minute, and if the data is de-identified, um, then there's a good chance it won't need an ethical review. So it doesn't mean that criteria. Are you going to talk about this, Mary? No. Yeah, I'm alright to go with this one. Okay, I don't want to steal your thunder. Um, so, if public benefit is so important, then understand what the public think we should do with data, and when it's applicable to do data is really important. I really like this report, um, done by the Wellcome Trust, started off with some qualitative work, some focus groups and individual interviews, but then moved to questionnaires and gets a bit of generalizability within it, so I like this one. Um, I'm sure there are other ones, and um, Larry will uh, tell us more about what's been found. But what they found out was in the public's mind, why is, it, why is this particular project for the public benefit, not just for private profit? That was in the public's mind of using non-consented personal health records. 
Um, can the people using my data be trusted to produce public benefit? Am I giving sensitive data that could be linked back to me? So is it pseudonymized? And are there safeguards on the, on the system? And these are the things that the public think about. It seems pretty sensible to me. I, I might think these things. Uh, and then the cart list, which is really helpful. So you can read it yourself, but basically grim, good, red, starting to get difficult. So if it's only for private benefit, it's not improving public health and you're using identifiable data, the public can't secure them. If you're over here, clear public benefit, involving public health workers, um, and this, this means they don't have to actively contribute to data, they quite like it if it's done passively. If you're over this side good, this side more challenging. The public benefit proves the panel will question these types of projects quite rigorous. Okay, so the Scottish model, so how do we do this in Scotland? Um, there are variations on this, but this is basically what we've got. We have quite a lot of public engagement and communication, so there's an ongoing stream of work that does that. Uh, we have somebody who's an expert in that. Um, the data sits in different places, uh, so there are some big warehouses with some data, but as I've said, there's a lot of it in the boards, there's a lot of it in the GP practice. There isn't a single warehouse that you can go to, there are multiple ones, but some of the warehouses have a lot of data. The projects that are done um, have to be in the public benefit, scientifically valid and ethically sound, and they're approved through the process that I've said. Now, now the interesting bit. There's this notion of safe, these four safes, safe people, safe data, safe places, safe outputs. And if I talk to the public, this is the slide that I use most. So not just anybody gets the data, we have a concept of approved researchers. Um, now an approved researcher, one bit of this you're not going to work. Approved researchers have done a course, so they've uh, taken, normally taken an MRC distance learning course, takes about two hours, which tells them about um, the legislation around the use of non-consented data and people's responsibility, it's a first thing. They sign the user terms and conditions around what they will do with that data. And the third part, which is the most challenging part, is at the moment, look, oh, oh, no, no, not yet. Um, the third part is that at the moment it's public sector organisations that get direct access to data. So it's the private sector. Now I know that's controversial and that's something which could be challenged, but that's the current state of play. The second thing is the data is de-identified. Um, so you get the data that you need to do the project, but you don't get vast amounts of data which has no relation to the project that you want to answer. Um, we have a network of safe havens across Scotland. Uh, I run the national one, but there are four regional ones as well. Um, that provides, uh, we provide uh, virtual private access, uh, virtual private network access to that, so it's remote access to it, but the data doesn't move out of it, and the software is provided in there. Statistical packages, machine learning packages can be provided within here, high performance computing, but we don't like the data to travel. There's no reason for it to travel, you can do the work in there. Um, and the outputs of, uh, normally dis uh, undergo statistical disclosure control. Now this model, we've been running it now for Three years, uh, 200 and odd projects have gone through, no data breaches, and the sort of problems they had uh, down south um, with care.data. data. This seems to be working quite well, but it does put some constraints on people. Again, uh, something that we can discuss. So this is the Idris service, this is what they try to do. Um, as when you make contact with an initial person that will get back to you, you try to form a relationship so you have the same person. <coughs> Um, they can help with study design, tell you about the data sets that exist, coding structures, um, strengths and weaknesses of various data sets. Sometimes you might suggest that data sets that you've not thought about using and don't know exist, so get those involved. Agree deliverables, timelines. They then help with the actual collation of the data, the actual getting the data from the different places, it, places joining it together and creating the linked data set, uh, and creating the technical infrastructure to make sure that everything's working. This slide isn't mine, but I was asked to use it. It's, I think it's working. Um, it's just to make the point that uh, the Scottish Government at the moment are going through a review of information governance. Uh, Andrew Fraser? Andrew Fraser is lead, leading that. I'm not sure the timeline's for reporting back, but some of the things down here that they intend to do, step change ideas that they want, these are quite interesting down here because they are talking about starting to allow data mining and some things which are not project based but being able to run machine learning across large data sets down here. So um, it is moving, it is changing. What I hope I've done is explain how it works at the moment so you've got some <coughs> insights into how to navigate through that, through that process. Yeah. 
this is what we want to be. We don't want to be pulling your hair out. We want to be friends. <laughs> So how does it stand with patients seeing their own data? Uh, well, so I'm talking about non-consented data. For the information governance around the clinician seeing data, sharing data. Right, so practice, if you could, in theory, link a patient, can a patient, is there any issue at all with patients seeing their own data? Well, it will be a subject to access request. Okay. That's how it's done. Yes. It's like okay. Okay. okay, thank you. So we have worked with big companies, we've worked with big pharma companies, uh, and the way it's been working with them is that they'd have a steering group, they'd have a board, and they'd be on it, they'd set the questions, they even set the algorithms to be run, they see reports that are coming back, but the actual researcher that's actually seeing the lines of individual data is not a public, a private section of the data, a public section of the data. It's a partnership where they work closely together, with outputs going back and discussion about them, and then more number crunching, but not sitting at home and seeing lines of patients. So do you think that can work on those projects and that we can employ yes. to do that? Okay. Either, either academics in universities or, you know, I have first statisticians in my team as well. Is that what I'm saying? Thank you. Uh, yeah, are there, is it possible to access from third or synthetic data sets that are going through the approval process? So as I said at the beginning, the synthetic data sets are at the end of uh, continue with the least governance. But if we get into a question of what did you mean by synthetic data, I was at a whole workshop yesterday with Steph where there were many people discussing what synthetic data <coughs> is, how close do you want it to replicate the real data? So what do you want? Do you want, you know, once a central tendency and all that kind of stuff in it, the nearer it gets to real data. It's to see the data points available. Oh yeah, that, that's not that's not a problem at all. Right. The schemas, the data schemas are not a problem. How would you go about accessing that? I mean, that, that's it's almost public knowledge. That's not um, that's not difficult at all. I don't think there's any governments around that saying what's in it and what the range of the codes are. Fine. I seem to have survived. It's easier than the Tory conference. Still the panel. <laughs> you can quiz it more later on the panel. But thank you very much, Steve. And now we have a kind of 15 minute coffee break. So uh, refreshments are at the back of the room, so please help yourselves. Thank you. And we'll start again in about 15 minutes. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm Barry Aitken. Um, I'm a research fellow at the University of Edinburgh, um, and I work in the public engagement stream of the FAR Institute. Um, so in my work, I'm conducting public engagement about health informatics research, um, which means I hold public conversations about the ways that, that healthcare data is used in research um, and about potential future uses of data. Um, and through that, I'm also conducting research into public attitudes, uh, public attitudes towards the use of healthcare data and public attitudes towards health informatics research. So today I'm going to talk about um, some of what we found in our research um, and talk um, about some of the key themes around what we already know about public attitudes towards um, uses of healthcare data and what that means for research, what that means for um, data science. So I'll start with a bit of background, a bit of context as to why this is so important, why um, I think it's really important that we're considering this and taking account of public attitudes. Um, so there's a, there's a growing body of literature, a growing body of evidence which is exploring public attitudes and public acceptability to uses of healthcare data, um, particularly in, in health informatics research. Um, and this is beginning to gain increasing attention, policy attention and attention across the data science community. Um, there's a number of reasons for this. Um, as we've already heard from, from Steve, public inter interest justifications are really central to everything that we do. There's, um, there's a, th this research has to be done for public benefit, there has to be a public interest justification for it. So we need to be thinking about the public in everything that we do. But I think also that there's increasing interest and increasing attention in public acceptability because there's a recognition of where things have previously gone wrong um, or where previous controversies have, um, have, have have given rise to public concern or, or, or a lack of public support. Um, and the most high profile example being the um, care.data down south, um, where there was significant media attention, um, which was focusing on public concerns, particularly around confidentiality, um, around transparency, and, and around commercial involvement in research or commercial access to, to patient data. Um, so this is this has highlighted the need to, to think about public attitudes up front, to engage the public from an early stage, and, and to think about how we work with the public, um, and to ensure that we have a social license for what we're doing. Um, and by social license, I mean, this is, this is about going beyond what's legally permissible. Um, there's a difference between being legally permissible and being socially acceptable. Um, in some cases, those two um, match up. In some cases, things which are legally permissible might not be wholly publicly um, accept accepted by the public. In other cases, there might be things which are publicly acceptable but not legally permissible. And it's important to take account of all of this and think about what it means to have a social license um, for the work that we're doing um, and how we can ensure that we're working, um, reflecting public interests, reflecting public preferences and addressing public concerns. But I want to stress now that I think that the importance of engaging the public and the importance of citizen involvement in, in your work is not just about avo avoiding controversy. This isn't about avoiding a negative or um, um, avoiding concern or opposition. It's actually a really positive. It's about strengthening research, improving research, and ensuring that you're addressing public values, addressing public interests, uh, reflecting preferences, um, and, and addressing concerns before they arise rather than, than seeking to avoid op um, controversy or opposition. So citizen involvement, um, I think, is, is really great that that's been highlighted as, as, a, as a key feature of, of what these projects need to in, in include. Um, and I think there's something to be approached as a really positive feature of the projects that can really add something very positive and, 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 and strengthen research projects. So as I said, I'm, I'm going to give a bit of a summary of the findings of our research in, into public attitudes to uses of healthcare data. Um, and as I said, there's a, there's a growing body of, of evidence, a growing body of literature, which explores this topic. There have been some, um, a number of recent studies, that, um, Steve um, highlighted the Wellcome Trust study, the One Way, one way Mirror, um, as a, studies by the MRC, and there's a, a growing body of, of international social, social science literature which engages with this topic. Um, this is using a variety of different methods, qualitative and quantitative methods. So there have been large-scale um, national surveys and questionnaires, but there's also a lot of qualitative research which looks in, at considerable depth at the reasons for people's preferences and the complexities of the um, nuances of public opinions and the conditions that are necessary to underpin public support. So um, in 2016, myself and colleagues at the University of Edinburgh conducted a systematic review of international studies on, on this topic um, to draw out the key themes of what we already know about public attitudes towards uses of healthcare data. Uh, this systematic review reviewed 25 international studies, um, and uh, now I'm going to present some of the, the key themes that we found, what we already know about public attitudes, um, but also draw on some of my own experience of um, conducting deliberations and having public conversations about, about these themes. 
So this is a summary of our systematic review. Um, as I said, this was a review of 25 international studies into public attitudes towards uses of, of healthcare data. And the headline result coming out of all of these studies is that there is widespread public support for, um, for health research, health research using patients' data. Um, this reflects generally very, very high public support for medical research and health research. And while data, data science and health research is not a familiar topic, certainly health informatics research is not a, a term that is in, in common vocabulary, um, but nevertheless, the support for health research seems to extend to health research conducted through data science. So there's, there's generally high levels of public support for this work. But nevertheless, this is always conditional support. So we should never take this public support for granted. Um, and, it, and as I said, it's important to emphasize the conditions that underpin the support and what, it, um, what are the terms on which people, people support this, this research. And our review identified a, a number of, of key conditions that underpin public support. The first of these, you probably won't be surprised, is, is confidentiality. But other people will, will engage in quite uh, in-depth conversations about what it means for data to be anonymous and, and, to, and discuss sort of the the limits of anon anonymization or the imperfection of anonymization. But that recognizing anonymization is not 100% uh, um, perfect doesn't necessarily lead to opposition. And that actually what people are more concerned about then is whether there are adequate safeguards in place and what the data security mechanisms are to protect against breaches of confidentiality. So it's not all about anonymization in, in the public mind. It's actually about what are, the, what are the sanctions in place if something went wrong? What are the safeguards that will protect my, um, protect my confidentiality, even if this isn't 100% anonymous? Um, so adequate safeguards are absolutely crucial and assurances of what those safeguards are. So people need to understand what the safeguards are in place. Um, and they need to understand or be assured that there, there is sufficient security of, of data. Another major, uh, another important condition for public support is that people are in control of their data. Um, people tend to talk about their data as their data. So even though it might not legally be recognized in that way, people think of it as their data. They think of it as relating to their life, to their health histories, um, and, they, and they want to have some control over it. They want to make decisions, or they want to be involved in decisions about how it is used or, or what it might be used for. But that doesn't necessarily mean explicit consent to every time a data would be used. Um, certainly in, in, the, in the conversations I have with members of the public, there's a recognition that that is um, not very practical. It's a bit burdensome for members of the public as well as for researchers, and it's not really what people want. Instead, control tends to mean um, transparency. So people want to feel that they, they know what data is being used, what it might be used for, and they want to feel confident that if they are concerned about something, they know who to talk to, they know where to go. So control doesn't necessarily mean consent, but it, it requires high degrees of transparency. So uh, these are our first four conditions, but under that, um, the big condition um, is public benefits. And this is absolutely crucial, as Steve's already, already flagged. Public benefits is absolutely central to everything that we do. It's a central justification for, for the research that we're doing, but in terms of um, public support, public acceptability, it is absolutely fundamental. So support for health research is always, um, is always rationalized in terms of this is, this is for the greater <coughs> good. It's public interest, it will bring public benefits. Public benefits here is, is the, the fundamental condition on, on which um, support is underpinned. So even if, um, so if, if even, even, even if all four of these conditions were met, if members of the public weren't satisfied that the project is gonna lead to, to public benefits, they, they won't be supportive. It need, the, the assurances of public benefits are, are really crucial. But pub public benefits is a very broadly, loosely defined term. Um, and I, earlier this summer, I, I ran a series of public workshops discussing public benefits and asking people what they thought that term meant. Um, and it was clear that there are very different ideas, firstly, of who the public is. So are we talking about the whole population? Or are we talking about particular patient groups? Uh, or are we talking about public services? And then what would it mean for them to benefit? Um, and again, there are very different ideas about what benefit would mean. So in some cases, if we're talking about a commercial organization who might make a profit, then people are thinking about some sort of financial benefit, maybe reinvestment into public service, services or the sources of, of data. Whereas if we're talking about academic or public sector researchers, it's more, um, it's more of an emphasis on um, improvements to healthcare, improvements to treatment, improvements to services or wider uh, public benefits. And obviously, as those, bound, as those lines are blurred, um, there's... Um, a great deal of openness about what that might mean in practice. But what is 
so while people don't have a clear um, definition of what they expect from public benefits, they nevertheless think it's fundamentally important that there are assurances that they have confidence that this project is aimed at public benefits. Now, of course, those assurances are only going to... Um, people are only going to have a confidence in those assurances if they trust the organisations handling the data, um, or trust the organisations involved in, in the research project. And this is really... Where, um, this is really... Everything hinges on, on this issue of trust. So whether you uh, have confidence in um, likely public benefits of the project depends on whether you trust the researchers, the research organisations, to um, trust their claims about public benefits. It also relates to the extent to which you trust that assurances of confidentiality being met. Do you trust the adequate s that there are adequate safeguards in place and adequate data security? Um, and do you trust the transparency that, uh, that facilitates control over data? So trust is really, um, is really crucial here. And where people don't have trust in research organisations um, or researchers or, or data custodians, um, this is where concerns are raised. And the sorts of concerns that, that, that come out um, relate to potential misuse or abuse of data, um, potential slippery slopes. So while we might be happy with what's proposed to be done with the data now, there are concerns that does that open up possibilities of other uses which we might not be happy with in the future. There are concerns that um, data analysis leading to policies or could lead to policies or practices which are designed for the masses. So what does that mean for an individual patient who, who um, doesn't fit with the trend? There are concerns about data being used for political purposes. Concerns that um, uh, accumulation of data in increases surveillance and leaves a big brother society. Um, and concerns that people can be labelled um, through, through um, uh, trends from data resulting in a stigma or, disc or discriminatory treatment. Um, so there's a wide range of concerns and even people who are in principle supportive of, um, of, of uses of healthcare um, data in, in research may express some of these concerns. But where they are convinced of the, the public benefits of the work, where they trust the research organisation or the researcher, um, they will, may nevertheless be supportive. Where they're not convinced of the public benefits or they don't trust the organisation, then these concerns become much more dominant. So to summarise, the, the key messages from, um, from this broad literature on, on public attitudes is that there is widespread public support. People want this research to happen. They're enthusiastic about it. They see it as being important. But that support depends on, firstly, assurances of confidentiality. Secondly, that they have some sense of control over one's data. Um, which, as I say, can mean can come about through transparency, um, but can mean different things. That there are meaningful commitments to bringing public benefits, and I'm stressing meaningful because I think what's really important here is to show that there are mechanisms in place to realise those public benefits. So there, are, we may not know exactly what the public benefits might be, but we might have a good idea, and we can plan for them and uh, anticipate them. And finally, it depends on public trust, and this is really the the crucial consideration. Um, but it's not straightforward. What it means for, um, for to have public trust is, is complex. Um, and trust is not something that can be manufactured or engineered. So I know that we should be focusing on public trust as a problem. It's not about how can we get the tr public to trust us. It's actually more about how can we ensure that what we are doing is trustworthy. Um, and in that way, we, we earn public trust. We don't um, manufacture it. And this is why citizen involvement is, is really, really important. Because to get trust, it's not about um, telling people about what we're doing, um, telling people how, um, or, or communicating sort of good news stories. It's actually much more about listening, listening to what people's concerns are, listening to what preferences are, and finding ways of addressing them and, and incorporating them into, into research projects. So I think that's why it's really exciting that citizen involvement has been flagged as an important part of these projects. And to think about the ways that, that we might do that, think about what that might mean, and the role that that can play in um, engendering and maintaining trust in, in all these projects. Um, which brings me to the end of my presentation and then some shameless self-promotion of recent <laughs> publications. <laughs> um, and I'll be happy to take any questions or, or comments. Thank you very much. That's uh, uh, excellent. Good to see all those uh, names from the University of Edinburgh up there <laughs> on those uh, papers. Um, so, in the, the, issue, the issue of public trust, is there any sense 
uh, in the public that uh, sometimes their trust is broken in terms of uh, over, overly uh, restricting use of data because uh, in some, there is an argument that patients uh, have a right to expect their data to be used to improve healthcare and that, uh, and that they should feel aggrieved if, if there are <coughs> processes in, in place which you know, overly restrict that use because we know that, uh, that lives will be lost. Yeah, and I think it's certainly part of that. I mean, often um, when I hold these public conversation events, and um, often, yeah, people don't, oft don't start with a great deal of awareness about what currently happens. Um, but often, one of the first reactions is, "Why don't you do more?" Or, "What? what is, why isn't this already happening?" Um, and the and the the reasons why we don't do more, the the considerations, the um, are really important and are recognised. But there is often a sense of um, for people who are supportive of this, they'd like to see more of it happening. Um, but of course, the, uh, there are also those concerns, and it has to be uh, it has to be mindful of Absolutely. that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's in some ways a follow-on question from that, and it also picks up a new point where there are different publics. So there are the public who have never had cancer, and then there are the public who have had cancer. And is there any sense in your systematic review of people's concept? Yeah, I think there is some evidence of that. Um, yeah, and, and certainly in my work, I find that it, if there people with particular experiences um, are more likely to support a project which is relates to those experiences. Um, that's difficult to kind of expand from that. Think about what does that mean um, for different contexts, and do we do we presume then that everybody who had those experiences would be supportive, and does that make that a more legitimate response? Is is a challenge, um, and I think also when part of the problem with um, thinking about how we approach citizen involvement is who are the citizens that we're involving, and is it just people who have direct experience? Um, is that the relevant public, or do we want to be involving everybody who could potentially, whose data could potentially be used? Um, and those are big questions, um, and big questions about if you're if you're looking to to involve people who don't have those experiences, well, that's much more challenging to even get them interested in that discussion, but potentially really important and really valuable. Yeah. That's great. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you. Mike disaster. <laughs> <laughs> So Brian, uh, Brian, take that if, if you don't want, but you can take them can off. I walk and actually, yeah, can you I can. I you can take them off and um, attach both because I think Maybe it's to maximise. Let's see how we do this. So, It's not out of choice, I'll tell you the story. <laughs> Are we okay? Are we, are we good? Yeah, okay. Um, hi everyone. So firstly, apologies. Um, I had meant to create the best slide deck ever that you'd seen this morning in PowerPoint. Um, however, my 10-month uh, uh, baby son decided to insert his finger into my wife's eye. Uh, and we've been spending the time shuttling between East Lothian and Edinburgh getting that triaged and sorted out. Um, it is sorted out now, uh, but as a consequence, you're going to have to listen to me speaking without any slides. Uh, and because I'm a data person, I'm going to feel deeply uncomfortable with that because I have no graphs to show you whatsoever. You're going to ask how your son's finger is. Presumably that's what you've been... <laughs> <laughs> he was trying to get more fingers into my eyes after that. Um, so uh, I'm Brian Hills. I'm head of data at the Data Lab. Um, my background is in industry in building data engineering uh, platforms, doing analytics and building data science teams. I've spent probably about 18 years doing that. So I've worked with Hewlett Packard, Sumerian, and most recently um, Skyscanner doing that. And then I moved to the Data Lab uh, two and a half years ago. So I'm going to admit to you guys that I am essentially a healthcare imposter. I am not a healthcare professional. 
Um, but what I do know how to do is build teams that deliver successful outputs from using analytics in a range of different industries. But in, in terms of the data lab piece, um, over the last two and a half years, um, we've started to build up a large portfolio of innovation projects across Scotland in healthcare and many different industries. And so the first slide that I would have shown you if I'd had time to do it was essentially the logos of all the, the partners that we've had in our innovation projects in healthcare, which would exceed one slide, uh, I have to say. Um, and I wanted to talk about some of the projects that we've been doing there, both in cancer and in other areas. Um, I'll give you some examples of that and also some of the education that we're doing that's underpinning the next generation of data people coming through that will be working in healthcare and other industries. And then I wanted to finish by summarising some of the learnings that myself and the team have taken from being two and a half years into this journey in the healthcare piece uh, and also some personal reflection um, from uh, a cancer experience as well. Um, so innovation, uh, projects at the Data Lab. Um, I'll start off, I'll give examples about, of about five, I think. Um, the first one I want to talk about is around delayed discharge. So we were involved in a collaboration with the Scottish Government and the NHS NSS on that. It's a very complex problem, as you will understand. But there was one particular element that we started to look at with those partners, and that was on people presenting themselves into hospital, what is the probability that that person will be delayed on discharge? So there's not currently, as I understand, a system that does that. Um, so uh, Richard and my team of data scientists was collaborating with the government and the NHS to get the data. Um, and over the course of a couple of weeks, came up with a model that was 97% accurate for one health board over a year of data, which was a very successful proof of concept for us. And typically in the data lab, we do these proof of concepts and we'll hand them back for others to then industrialise them and scale them out. Um, so that's being tested in other health boards around Scotland at the moment. It's delivering the same type of results, which is great. Uh, and hopefully that will then be productionised and, and put into the, the relevant systems. But a learning for us in that was that Richard actually only spent two to four weeks doing the data science. The elapsed time of that project was 18 months. So learning for us is how do we actually scale the effort up but reduce the time down to do that? Obviously, there's very important pieces around information governance that the guys have talked about. Um, but there's other elements in terms of earning the trust of the healthcare professionals that want to work with you in industry to do that. And the reason we've been able to do a lot more healthcare projects, I believe, is because we're starting to develop that over time. So the second one is um, infinitely more scary than that, I think. This is a project that I work with Steve on. Um, so if you thought it was hard to access data just within Scotland itself, this project has the concept of running experiments across European jurisdictions. So Scottish data, Italian data, French data, uh, data from Switzerland, Luxembourg, and being able to answer questions using that data. So that's funded by the European Institute of Digital Technology. We have partners in Italy and Scotland working on it with us as well. And the concept really there is kind of three tier architecture. The first tier is can we get Steve and his peers across Europe to come together in a data healthcare federation where they learn best practices around developing safe havens and using data in their country. Can we also then uh, drive them to collaborate in using that data to answer questions that are not currently, uh, we're not currently able to answer? Many of those questions in healthcare will be around the fact that we don't have large enough populations in any one country to produce statistically significant um, analysis. So that's one tier, that's about the data and healthcare providers. The second tier then we're looking at is around a broker level. So a non-for-profit non body that acts as a go-between between customers that are looking for experiments and that healthcare federation to specify and understand those uh, requests, understand if they can be delivered and be the liaison for running those. It's very similar to the Idris model that's actually run in Scotland just now. And the third tier on that is customers. So research bodies, uh, public health bodies, but also industry in commissioning those experiments. So we've been running that for about one and a half years now, two years. Um, and towards the end of this year, we're having some very interesting conversations with potential customers uh, and organisations in the Federation as well. So that's a couple and a couple more that I'll touch on quickly. Um, so uh, with the Beatson, we've actually sponsored a project. So in the Data Lab, we fund academic experts to work with public sector bodies and industry. And in the Beatson case, we are funding uh, experts in deep learning in academia to work at looking, looking at some of the image data around neck cancer 
and understand if they can apply deep learning uh, technologies to that to better interpret uh, that imagery in, in a faster way than can be done by humans. Um, so we're also doing one in cardio. So at the Jubilee, we're working with two of the leading clinicians there and helping them with the cardio registry. And that's a partnership with Glasgow, AstraZeneca uh, and the Jubilee. Um, so getting the, the registry up to scratch, but also starting to do some really interesting analytics. Those clinicians came to us desperate for wanting to use data. They wanted to shorten the time to making decisions um, and they wanted to make better decisions. So having them on board from the start and actually come to us has been great. And then another one actually looking at new types of technologies is one with the Internet of Things. So we're sponsoring um, academics and Robert Gordons to work with Alban Housing in Invergordon, which is kind of close to where I actually grew up, um, instrumenting new build houses to put elderly people in them and monitor how they live in a house. And they want to run lots of experiments on that. So for example, one of the hypotheses is that um, elderly people fall over a lot because they're dehydrated. So all the water sources in those houses are instrumented with sensors. And the very brainy academics are going to try out new models of monitoring the water flow from taps or whatever, and also out of toilets, I believe. I don't know what the model's like. Um, to see if there's any correlation that can be drawn between the use of water and falling over in the elderly people. And that will be a living lab for lots of different experiments. And then finally, uh, on the international front, we're starting to do stuff with UNICEF. So if you were at DataFest last year, or this year actually, it feels like last year, um, you'll, uh, you'll have noticed we're starting to collaborate. Um, and there we're at the early stages of looking at a project on childhood obesity. So for us, the collaboration really has to be focused on delivering value to Scotland, recognising that UNICEF is global. But they're interested in partnering with us, um, NHS and the government, but also industry supplying data sources and looking at the, the large challenge we have in that area. So there's lots and lots of projects going on uh, that we're funding and participating in healthcare now. So while we're not, and I'd say not, we're not healthcare experts, we're starting to learn on what makes a successful data science innovation pro um, project in healthcare. Backing that up then, and, and just briefly, is education portfolio. So the, the new wave of talent coming through to help answer the questions that need to be answered in this field both within government uh, and, uh, and the NHS and also with industry. So um, our skills programme has scaled significantly since we started and we now last week started 130 master's students across nine universities in Scotland uh, across 16 courses. So data science, data science and engineering, uh, lots of different areas in AI as well. And key for us is to try and encourage those students to stay in the country and go into organisations to then gain employment. So many of those students have had placements within uh, NHS local authorities or uh, companies using healthcare data. In fact, I know that the NSS have hired over 10 of those students permanently uh, in the last year, which is great. So there's lots of new talent coming through that can be tapped in as well. And we sponsor PhDs, so we've got some PhDs, I think, with uh, NHS Lothian, uh, looking at cancer specifically, and NHS Fife as well. But backing that up in the education pieces, uh, professional development for people who are already in employment and want to learn new data skills or update those data skills. So we've launched a professional development programme and that looks at a number of different areas that are interesting specifically into healthcare. So um, executive education has taken off for us and we speak to leaders around the country in the public sector and industry about using data to deliver better outcomes for their business or their organisation. That went down well. <laughs> Here, here, everybody says. Um, so, and we firmly believe that unless you have executive and leadership sponsor for getting involved in any of this data stuff, you're going to get nowhere. So that really is helping us drive on a lot of the other initiatives downstream in terms of projects and education. The final one is we're starting to do online training as well. Um, so we've launched, or we are developing in collaboration with universities and industry online training programmes. A lot of the data science online is data science 101. There's lots of it out there. It's not a good use of public funds to, for us to do anything in there. So specifically what we're focusing on is the application of data science into specific domains. So we've got five that we're developing just now, two of which are in healthcare. Uh, one is specifically on pre uh, precision medicine and stratified medicine, and that's with uh, Edinburgh, Aridia, uh, and a couple of other partners. Um, and a second one about healthcare, health and social care data science as well. So there's lots of stuff that we're starting to uh, develop in, in this space. 
So that's probably enough about a summary of what we're doing there. Um, uh, some of the, the learnings that I have from the last two and a half years and the team that have been working with us uh, on this. Um, so I think coming from industry, it's been quite interesting, and I'm, I'm going to pick on Steve for this one. So I've been working quite closely with Steve for the last year and a half on the EIT project. And uh, in my last place of employment, we used data to also create new products to sell data and make money from it. Um, and I was asked to get involved in the project EIT to build a commercial business model around this stuff. And I sat opposite Steve in the first meeting and I kind of viewed Steve's, Steve as my nemesis because there's no way in hell that data is going to be ever going out of wherever it comes from. Um, but actually that last year and a half has been a really interesting journey I think for both of us. Um, and for me, especially in the ethical side, uh, and in industry, we didn't really care about the ethics of what we were doing with the data or the decisions that we were making with the data. And when we step into this world, that's obviously a key pillar of, of what you do. And so a lot of the learnings that we're taking from that project, we are taking those and steering at a national scale what we do in terms of educating the new wave of talent coming through or the companies that we're working with. So I'll give you a quick example of that. So two weeks ago, we were at a conference uh, and a bank, big bank, stood up and they talked about, and they did this definition of a data scientist, what is a data scientist? So you might be familiar with, it's a radar diagram and it's machine learning and statistics and ability to communicate. Um, and I, I put my hand up and I know the guys quite well, so it, it was just a bit of banter. But, um, so they said, this is going to be a difficult question. Um, and I said to them, well, you don't have ethics on the definition of a data scientist. Are, you, are your team not ethical in what you do with banking data? And then they said to me, well, of course we are. Yeah, we look at that stuff. And it was kind of brushed off and moved on to the next thing. So there's a lot of learnings I think we can take from the space in our work at the Data Lab in terms of what we do around industry and what we're driving forward um, in Scotland. So that, that, kind of sub that leads to my kind of key learning out of this, I think, in terms of what we've done in the last two and a half years, that if you want to be successful in this space and in, in the challenge it's set, then you have to focus on your ability to collaborate with the stakeholders in that space. So if I was looking at an application, I would obviously look at the technical side and the data science side and the, out, the impacts from it. But a key thing for me would be to see if you have the ability to collaborate with the stakeholders that you need to, um, and you've got the evidence that you've done that in the past. Because without that collaboration, you're not going to be able to solve complex problems. As a lot of what we've learned from UNICEF now and the collaborations we've done with those guys internationally, they often say that complex problems cannot be solved by one body alone. It has to be <coughs> collaboration. So if you can't do that, it doesn't matter what AI toolkit you've got, what access to data you've got, you're not going to get there. Um, I think, so the second and final point then um, for me would be on data science in general. So obviously, uh, massive developments in artificial intelligence technologies and deep learning and vision and natural language processing recently new compute, new algorithms, new data, all that kind of stuff. Um, but, and that, it will, that will be central to a lot of the developments in healthcare um, going forward. Uh, and that will take a period of time to bed in and be effective. But I think I always like to look at the counterpoints to the arguments that we make in data. And I think uh, we should also look at the small data elements of this to look at where we can make big gains from small data. So there's a great book by a guy called Martin Lindstrom called Small Data. Has anybody heard of it? One nod. Go and look at it. So he is a marketer who's commissioned by some of the largest br brands in the planet. And his job is to analyze small data. So Coca-Cola will commission him to spend time with a family. And he will observe how that family live. He's not necessarily observing how they drink Coca-Cola when they drink it, but just how they live their lives, how they interact with each other. So probably more in your terms, it's more of the kind of ethnographic analysis. And he takes that small data, so this is nothing to do with Hadoop or deep learning or anything like that. And from his experience, he will then recommend back to that brand what they should do in terms of product development and what they should do in terms of marketing and various other things. And in his book, he's got lots of really interesting stories where just very small insights have allowed major companies to pivot and make significant changes. So... We play that back into the healthcare space. I absolutely agree with all the new tech and all the great stuff that's coming out are going to be fundamental to a lot of this stuff. But I wouldn't forget the smaller data and the analysis that your products and working with clinicians and others will be able to surface. So I'll share a personal experience um, of that. 
Um, so three months ago, I got a call from my mum, um, and she lives in Tain, which is just north of Inverness, um, and she said, uh, I've got something to tell you. So at that point when she says that, I think this is not going to be good. Um, so she'd been to the, the doctor and she'd found a lump in her breast uh, and the lymph node under her arms had changed shape. Um, and uh, so I'm a data guy, so I'm doing the probability on this. So I'm thinking, okay, you smoked all your life. That's not good. Uh, your mother died early from breast cancer. That's not good either. So the probabilities aren't looking good. The doctor said to her, um, I think it's okay from this initial examination, but you are 73. You don't get a mammogram every, uh, every year now, so you should go in and get one. And that was lined up. So uh, she went in, she had the mammogram, um, and she was diagnosed with cancer. And um, so my probability in my head was actually correct, unfortunately. Um, and she has had since had the treatment, has been taken out. It was, um, it was uh, discovered to be the most aggressive type of cancer you could have in the breast but it was very, very small, so they think they caught it in time. And yesterday, she started on the radiotherapy. Um, so there, there's some lines from that that I took through the conversations on the phone that we had um, about the small data element and actually speaking to the patient. So some of her uh, um, experience in that was really interesting for me because I'm looking at it through the lens, probably not emotionally, but probably through a data lens. Um, and so often when I would speak to her and she had a consultation, what she'd say to me was, um, Brian, I've, I just had too much information. I can't understand everything that I've been told. Um, and so I put the data lens onto that and I say, okay, that data should be summarized in a better way. Maybe it shouldn't all be communicated at the same point by the professionals. Maybe there's an app, maybe there's some way that we could use some techniques to summarize it for you or something like that. And the second point, and there's a few points, and I won't go into them all, but the second point was during the, the treatment when she went in for the operation. Um, so they drove the 40 mils to rig more, and in the morning everybody um, has to get preps, you have to be in for 8 o'clock, and then you're scheduled after that, I understand. So that went fine. Now, she had an accident when she was younger, and she lost a limb, so she has an artificial leg. So as part of the prep, she had to take the leg off, um, as you'd expect, to get ready. But unfortunately, they didn't have any wheelchairs on the ward. So they asked my dad, who's 78, to go to another ward and find a wheelchair for her. Um, and uh, so my mum is in an increased state of distress at this point, given everything that's happening, and then her husband has to, has to leave. Now, for me, it's, that's not a, a clinician or a medical professional issue. I have no doubt that if somebody had a small piece of information saying that she only has one leg and needs a wheelchair, wheelchair that that would have been there. So it's these small little bits of data that can cause significant impact to the patient experience. And I think the previous challenge was talking about that as well. But what I would say in the context of this challenge and the, the questions that have been defined where it looks to say, can we work with clinicians or people on wards to deliver better efficiencies? For me, it's not just about throwing very heavyweight tools at this and looking for the biggest sets of data you can get from Steve. It's probably spending some time with these people and actually observing and taking down the small pieces of information that you could use your technology to actually address some of those problems and, and cause a bigger impact. So I, I'm going to stop there. I'll leave you with two recommendations of things that I think are really good to look at to get some inspiration. Um, have you heard of the TED Talk by Jason Leach? No? Go and look at it. It's exactly on this point. It's Jason Leach and it's on the things that matter to me. Uh, he did a TED talk in Glasgow. We had him in DataFest. It was amazing. It was really about somebody coming on who wouldn't come into hospital and he couldn't understand why. Uh, and from that, they, I think they launched this initiative to have the five things that mo mattered the most to somebody in hospital. So any healthcare professional visiting them during the period of stay would know what really mattered to that patient. Again, this has nothing to do with Hadoop or AI, but it really matters. And the other one I just came across last week, actually, really on the, on the tech side, if you want to get really techy, is a guy called Abu Qadar. I think we can tweet this stuff anyway afterwards. You can pick it up. So Abu, um, I'm just learning his story at the moment, but he was 15 and he went to Afghanistan, some terrible stuff there. But anyway, he started to use Google to learn data science, and he started to ask these questions. And at the end of it, he produced... Um, one of the most powerful neural networks from not knowing anything about data science that analyzed open data mammogram uh, images. 
close your ears, Steve. Um, and uh, it was proven to be one of the most accurate models that's ever been created. And he did that, I think, at the age of 17. Very inspirational if you're into the tech and looking to do stuff. So I think we'll get some of these things tweeted up and you can take them off the, uh, you can take them off the Twitter handle. Mm -hmm. Okay, hope that's been useful. So we heard at the beginning of the afternoon that, that we want uh, from the, this research something which will really uh, add value to the current way we do things, uh, which would help to uh, modernise and transform cancer health services. So you know, there's probably a lot of people in this room who are interested in, in you know, developing a, a product, whether that's an app or something, but um, it strikes me that uh, a lot of those cases, that, that might be a fairly long game. And I'm just wondering, um, uh, in terms of what this program is interested in funding, how far down the uh, tracks towards actually ending up with the product do you want, do you want this work uh, to be? Do you want it to, for example, if somebody just put in an application which was largely about collecting background descriptive information, collecting patient priorities or clinician priorities, and that, that sort of thing. Um, and perhaps you know, doing some very basic trialling of, some, uh, of, a, of a technique, would that be enough? But, so it's really you know, how, how far down the, the, the track of getting something up and running uh, do you want these applications to be? Well, I, think you're all, you're all I think we could all answer that. answer that, but I think from the clinician's perspective, the way this has been structured is we, we don't want to restrict thinking you know, um, the whole idea of going down a, a, a very, very unusual procurement te you know, methodology is to try and free up thinking and look beyond traditional boundaries, particularly look beyond the healthcare sector. <coughs> the way, additionally, the funding is for those successful applicants is structured is there's three months to think about the feasibility <coughs> and six months to actually undertake a piece of work which then at the end of it, there'll be a judgment about the scalability of it all. <coughs> I think going back to Steph's time frame, the end of phase two takes us to 2019, February 2019. <coughs> and the idea at that point is then pursuing the upscaling of it all. So in other words, we're not <coughs> using this route to fix the problems in my clinic right now. I just want to build on a theme that Brian's developed in the <coughs> last case. I have, in this new role, I have the, the fantastic opportunity as a clinician. I mean, I'm way out of my comfort zone in terms of the people I'm now meeting and so on. But I'm very inspired that, that, about the possibilities. <coughs> but I 
think people who are, work out with the healthcare sector have to be aware of where we're starting from. Um, you know, we're now beginning, well, we're, we've now established an electronic <coughs> health record, which working electronically has been out with the health sector for far longer. That's where we are. But I was, I'm, I'm going to plagiarise uh, a, a presentation I heard as recently as Monday, where an organisation was saying we wanted we had great ideas about AI, but we went into <coughs> the health sector, not just in the UK, but far beyond, even at the Mayo Clinic, and realised that most of healthcare is dependent on clinicians with pagers and bits of paper in their back pocket. So before people could really embrace AI, they had to look at our actual ways of working just now. And that's what you're talking about. The small data is actually, and the way this company's gone about it is it's gone and followed around the teams to see how they work. And they can then say, well, you know, if it takes seven hours as the average time between you ordering a test, and actually the first time that test result is looked at um, before it's acted on, there are, there are ways we can actually streamline that in an, it was in an acute medical situation, it wasn't looking at cancer data. So we're not looking for something to actually solve my clinical problem just now. You are, we are looking at innovative techniques that's going to look to the future, but we also have to recognise that there are ways of working that need to be adapted and, and changed before we can actually maximise the opportunity of new uh, uh, data science to, to what we're doing. I think one of the key things to understand is when we set this up, there are a lot of people who went, well, what are, when are we going to get prototypes out of this? And you may notice that phase two isn't a prototype, <coughs> it's a proof of concept. Because the key thing for us is to manage the expectations. We know you're unlikely with £150,000 to solve some of these very fundamental problems. But the challenge for you is to be able to show a clear trajectory of this is where we are, these are the partners we're going to work with, this is how we can go to a situation where we can deliver something that is going to be scalable, that is going to be adopted, that is going to solve some problems. So some of the part of the feasibility study is dealing with the information governance issue, some of it is make sure that you have partners, make sure you have stakeholders, make sure that you have people who can help you turn your visions into reality, and then phase two, <coughs> you do, doing the proof of concept, is about being able to show that you can start to bring these people together and you can start to deliver <coughs> the vision that you've set out. I think we all will understand that there's not a huge amount of money in this. So we are just pump priming. I think one of the key parts of Steph's job when she's not doing stuff like this is the what happens next. How do we get money for what happens next? So we were very much in addition that once we got the money to start this, the next conversation wasn't, well, how do we run it? It's how do you get the money to do the next steps? Yeah. So we're very clear that this is part of a longer program and you know nobody's going to hold you to unreasonable deliverables because what we are trying to do is to spur innovation. We know we're not trying to set people up to fail. Because so I yeah. think if you say to somebody, here's 150K, I want a prototype, then you're just guaranteeing that it's going to fail. And that's not what we want. What we want to see is how people can see how new ideas <coughs> will actually be translated into real services which can be adopt which are adoptable. Is there anyone else on the panel? Um, I, I suppose only only to add that there's phase one and there's phase two. Yes. So the first lot of money is about exploration, but then you're in competition to go from the original number of projects down to the ones that receive the second amount of money. So that sustainability and you know, how much benefit will it add is all part of that process for making that assessment. So it's, uh, it's worth thinking about, I guess. But we do understand the context in which you're proposing to deliver yeah. this. And if you said, well, I will solve the world, I think yeah, phase two will just be kind of, you know. So demonstrating sustainability would be about demonstrating that you've got enthusiastic partners that's, that's something which is novel. It, it may be a matter of saying, I have health boards who are interested, I have networks that are interested, I have clinicians that are interested, I have platform providers that can deliver my solution. You know, for everybody it's going to be, it's going to be slightly different, which in one sense makes the joy of trying to review applications great, because it's going to be all sorts of things and none of them are really comparable. But in one sense, it's up to you to be able to bring networks and to develop networks and to develop ideas. The great advantage of this is that there is plenty of scope. 
Good for you to be in the position. Yeah. We hope. A quick question about you. No, sorry, I'll leave behind you. Just for that. I've got a question about the current um, Scottish Cancer Registry. Yeah. Uh, this is, I presume, some sort of registry where you store all the national cancer data at the moment. Could you tell me more about how it works and how that helps you with um, potentially going into precision medicine? Does it have enough data for you to be able to extract it already, or is it... Um, quite old or doesn't have all the data, you know, in terms of... Um, Okay, so, so we're really, exactly really lucky that the person behind you, Karen, uh, sitting there, uh, is uh, key to running the cancer registry. So rather than us guessing, I suspect we should listen to the expert, Karen. So she'll, she'll tell you what's in there. I could tell you a bit, but she knows more. Yeah, so um, the registry is a population-based registry, and it's been running since 1958. So it's one of the uh, oldest historic um, data sets that we have in Scotland. And what we do is we process data from multiple um, cancer notifications that we come, but it's basically um, data from multiple sources or multiple different data sets. Um, link all that data up to the Scottish Cancer Registry um, system, and it creates um, provisional records, which is person-based, and a person can have multiple tumours. That data is then provisional, and we have um, cancer information staff who are based across the, all the health boards in Scotland, and they then view that data, um, make decisions on the data, whether to confirm it as a valid cancer re registration um, or simply to, to delete it. The data that we hold is um, all uh, invasive cancers, um, in situ, uncertain behaviour, and some benign tumours, but not all. So we only collect benign information on brain, bladder, um, spinal and teratoma of testes. Uh, what we do is we the, the information that we collect the full data set is broken down into um, uh, demographics, uh, diagnostic information, treatment information, um, the characteristics of the cancer, so the morphology, the type, the, be the behaviour of it, uh, and the stage of the cancer. So we um, use many different staging classifications, so TNM, FIGO, uh, Breslau, Clarks, depending on the actual tumour. Um, group yes. um, sorry, what was the last <coughs> question? So how this data is currently being used? Or is it easy to look at the data and make decisions based on the patterns Yeah, so the, the ISD publishes um, uh, information every year on um, survival analysis and the incidence rate across um, the previous year, so it can go right back to um, whatever time period you're looking at. The data is mostly used for service provision, um, and also to monitor the effectiveness of things like the breast screening program as well. We've got uh, close links to the, the genetic service, so we've actually got cancer gene uh, genealogists that work closely with us, and they use that information to build up family trees and, and pedigrees to make <coughs> clinical decisions on patients' risk of um, and, and hereditary uh, uh, cancers. Um, as for the stratified medicine part, I'm not too sure. We haven't actually, not that I know of, have we been involved in anything um, like that yet. But we have got a project um, ongoing just now, which is a two-year project, and it's looking at pulling in other data sources. So we're looking at um, chemo chemotherapy and radiotherapy and um, more specific uh, treatment information. So it may be that at some point we, we can move <coughs> forward there. Would the clinicians have access to this because the registry at the moment is no. more national level? No. It's more so national the level. The, um, you can access the data through research, through um, applications, through Steve's team. Um, you can also go through the, the PVAP route as well. Um, but no, the, the data isn't physically. Um, so it's aggregated data that's available. On, on the website, but there isn't any um, identifiable information on the website. <coughs> so, just following up on that, um, the Scottish Cancer Registry historically is one of the best, with the best reputation, certainly in Europe and beyond. And that's 
due to the meticulous nature in which it's been conducted. So it's got a great reputation. What I would say though is we recognise the world is changing and the, the cancer registry has recently been reviewed and we are in a transition period where we're keeping going what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis but we're trying to start lo looking at how we have to change that service to respond to the changing world around us. <coughs> And there was an external review of the Scottish Cancer Registry and it made a number of recommendations and we're going to be moving to a Scottish Cancer Registry and Intelligence Service. You can immediately see the language is changing to reflect the changing world. But at the moment, in answer to your question, and in terms of the time frames we are talking about, I think Karen's given a very good summary of the current kind of data source and who can look at it just now and how it works right now. Hi, I'm Janine Figueroa from the University of Edinburgh, and so I um, I had two questions actually, actually following up on this current conversation. Um, Hillary, you mentioned I guess there's some changes going on or with the uh, cancer registry. I'd be very curious what uh, those recommendations are in terms of what the aims are for changing the cancer registry for the future, because I'd be very in interested in understanding well, it. it. It's really just, I mean, there was a detailed external, an external review of our registry and it made 24 recommendations and I don't want to go into all the detail of it all, but it's just to try and make this more fit for purpose. At the moment, at the coal face, the cancer registry is a kind of black hole, you know, it, it, you know down there. On a day-to-day -day basis, it doesn't impact on the way I treat my patients. It's used to look at trends and overall population statistics and so on. Um, but having said all that, if we make ad hoc requests, we get a lot of support, etc., from them. But in terms, for example, in my own field of breast cancer, a really important thing I want to know about is recurrent rate. Recurrent rate. And I want to know it for a whole variety of reasons, but two practicalities is there are two major changes of how we operate in patients just now. One is the armpit and one is what we do to the breast. And both of those, if you're going to radically change the way you're going to treat the patient, surely you need to know the baseline to see are we going to improve the rate at which recurrence happens, you know, diminish the rate of recurrence, or are we going to actually make it worse by changing what we do? And even with one of the best cancer registries in the world, the way these patients present with recurrent disease is so difficult to capture, we don't have an accurate way of doing it, an absolute accurate way of doing it. So that is an example whereby we have to start changing the way we can um, look at data. Sure, we'll, we're always gonna have standard national reporting that will inform the dialogue at these annual meetings I was telling you about. But if there's variance, what we need to do is to be able to drill down and say, why is it different before we start making judgments? And we need to have a service that can react very agilely to that. Now we've got a situation just now in one tumor specific network, we've run their annual data and there's quite a variance for a couple of health boards. The clinicians as a group said, before we make judgments, we need to ask further questions and drill down. We don't have the established linkages for that. So the clinicians asked me in March and said, this is what we need. This is now October. I still don't have my data. Because of the current process, we have to identify budget. We have to identify staff. We have to build the linkages before we can run the reports. That's the current mechanism. The new world we envisage will be that we'll be able to somehow have a technical, technical solution that with the permissions, if Steve's happy, We'll be able Steve. to Steve, I wish it was Steve, if Steve's happy, we can then say, ah, right, we've looked at the data, oh, can we look at this further information because it's all there. There must be technical solutions to be able to, to do that. That was very helpful. Um, and then my second question is actually about the uh, challenge uh, funding itself. My sense is obviously that it has to have a it sounds like there should be a public-private partnership in terms of the applications um, to make it successful, which I am obviously in favor of. Um, but I'm curious, is there um, sp specific uh, uh, limitations or types of partnerships in terms of, I'm an academic, obviously, so I'm not in the private sector. Um, um, and given that this is about small business research innovation, I think it was, I don't remember the exact acronym. 
Um, so are there, are there certain types of uh, uh, businesses and, and, and enterprises that you're interested in seeing links with in terms of academic research partnerships? <coughs> in one sense, the fundamental thing is the applicants need to be based on the EU and they need to be legal entities. <coughs> and you need to understand that this is the amount of money that's still offered and we're not offering you anymore. I don't think that's out there in each criteria, but who your partners are. So you may come in and say, you know, the University of Edinburgh plus certain large multinationals, or it could be plus someone in Sky who is really good at data. It's up to you to set up your partnership in any way you want, as long as it's led by a EU institution. And I'd say that actually an EU yeah. registered company. Past that, it's up to you. A lot of it is really about the story you tell about the partnership you bring and how this will add value which other people may not. So a lot of it is about how you tell the story of what your partnership can do with a limited amount of money <coughs> to help deliver some of the outcomes. And universities can apply. I, was, I, 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 yeah, I sure think that's what you were like. I always think private, and, and all my colleagues were like, no, 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 you're, yeah, everybody was still. Well, there. universities can <laughs> apply. Uh, if, if you look at the competition, uh, universities can apply. That's one of the questions that gets asked quite a lot. However, they have to show a fair route uh, to market uh, that is a commercial, you know, there's commercial potential. So it's not a research, you know, project funding as such. It, it, I guess it's the commercial potential, sorry, uh, is that to basically then sell it on to... What do you understand by commercial potential from the SBRI um, uh, perspective? I think Does the project then need to make money or, you know, what, what sort of what is it exactly the goal, goal of SBRI is to produce a, pro a product which the NHS can buy. Okay. In one sense. There's many different ways you can deliver a, pro a product to market. It may be a matter of you have something which drops into someone else's existing service. You know, I was in a discussion a few weeks ago with a visualization company that wants to build a market for algorithms. So you can build algorithms that can, <coughs> can detect things in x-rays, and they want to be able to replace you know, this week's algorithm with something else next week. We're not going to tell you how to do that, but if you come in and say, I've got a brilliant idea, it will do all these wonderful things, I have absolutely no idea how this will actually end up in a service which clinicians can use, then we're not going to be interested. All right, so it basically means something that can be then purchased by the NHS and this like sort of market ready, supportable, and with all the infrastructure more than, you know, how much is it being sold? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, essentially like the that. SBRI framework is taking an idea and taking it to a point where it's ready to be sold and taken, uh, you know, and you know, you can go to the NHS and look, we have this idea, we've tested it, we've developed it, there's a proof of concept, and this is the team that we have in place. Would you like to buy it? Okay, thank you. Well, I, that was my question. A question in the back Question again related to that. So, intellectual property. Mm -hmm. Where do you expect intellectual property for this sort of exploit to, um, to belong? Because there, there is this conflict between benefits to society versus benefits to another party organisation. So, we've taken some data, um, we have used that to develop a product. Mm -hmm. Where does, um, is there any idea as to how the, the IP should? This is not an IP grant. The whole point is to fund innovation which the NHS can buy. The whole idea is not to generate IP which the NHS will own. You know, it says in the contract you will license the IP or the product that comes out to the NHS on a fair and reasonable market rate. But it's not an IP grant. You keep the IP. This is the whole the whole point of this the right process is not for government entities, large entities to create and harvest IP. So in one sense the IP framework is entirely up to you and your partnership. So, so that is really the question it's not. So, so is that valid argument then to say the benefit to society is that by being involved in this project um, there is no product on the market that will benefit people in the NHS for example or patients in the NHS? I would say yes. 
Because if, you, if the NHS is now in a position it can do things in terms of treating patients that it couldn't do before, that's a benefit to society. Um, and, and sorry, just to touch on the IP issue, when you look at the black contract, you will see um, there are certain IP clauses that lots of uh, companies do pick up on and ask about. Uh, because there's a clause about how if you do not exploit, make reasonable efforts to exploit the IP within three years, we'd like it back. Uh, that's, uh, some companies read that as an IP grab, but it's not. It's just to make sure that you're not just, we haven't just given you money to build something that you need to sit on and do nothing with. So it's reasonable efforts. You know, we understand that maybe the breach of, you know, taking a product to market takes more than three years. But as long as we know that you're actually doing something with it, instead of, we'll take this money, we'll create this cool thing, and we'll just sit on it and just never come back to it. Uh, so there is that clause. Uh, so in case you do see that when you look at the black contract, when you look at the competition documents, that's why it's there. So once once you register on the website, you get access to all the competition documents. So you can see all that now if you want to. And I work for a medical imaging company. Is mm -hmm. there an existing medical imaging uh, database that's correlated with clinical income? That we used in this project. That's correlated with? Your Am I meant to do your homework for you? <laughs> <laughs> no, we look at what it is. Is there a way to actually access um, medical imaging data and also have access to clinical outcome for patients? And that would be interesting. So, the clinical imaging data set, as I said, is um, being produced. At the moment, there's only a clinical system in the NHS, and you can only retrieve data on an individual patient level. So you can't, there isn't database, you can't search it, you can't um, ask for patients for a particular kind or a particular modality, that's not possible. So we are trying to create that database, but as I said, it's probably about 18 months away from being possible to use. That said, there are lots of consented data sets that are out there, and there are people in the room that work with, uh, with clinical data. In terms of outcomes, um, depends what you mean by outcomes, but certainly if you know the individuals, they can be linked to their hospital records going forward and their death records. So hospital readmissions with ICD-10 diagnosis codes and uh, death registrations and cause of death outcomes are possible. It's getting the original images um, is more challenging. In terms of then there's a question from the live stream uh, after this one. <laughs> I just wanted to ask about partnerships and um, collaborations. Is there anything that you could do to help uh, the companies or academics to actually find partners within the NHS that would help with access to the data or when, if we wanted to observe how the clinicians work at the moment or, and get that small data insights? how? Would we go about it? Do we need to find those connections ourselves, or will you be able to help in putting us in contact with some of the collaborators with that you? Well, in one sense, that's part of the idea for the collaborating event after this one. But if you were looking for people with certain skills, let us know. Um, for the last call, for example, we had clinicians who said, I can do this, this, and this. Is there anyone who wants to work with them? And they were inundated with people who went, oh, yeah, I'm happy to talk to you. So if you have particular sets of skills or sets of experiences that you are looking for, or particular types of partners you're looking for, you know, let us know and we can try and match them. You know, we can't guarantee, but we can <coughs> try. Thank you. I actually have two clinicians that couldn't make it today that do want me to circulate their details afterwards uh, who want to partner up because they have some ideas and they're happy to work with other people on their views. Uh, Alan's going to read out the question from the live stream. Hi, uh, it's a question from Marcus Vernon. Uh, is it correct to infer that the clinicians are expecting or hoping for systemic data engineering proposals as opposed to diagnostic tools or assistance based in data science or machine learning? Yes to all. <laughs> I mean, potentially yes to all. Um, and I suppose um, if, we, if we look at, I mean, when you're trying to formulate an actual application, you can go into sources to try and find out what are nas a national strategic direction, which will say that these are you know, big uh, gaps and this is the direction of travel, this is where the Scottish Government, for example, has said this is where we want, but also it's by 
finding out from clinicians where the main gaps are, and um, that you're going to that's going to heavily influence the direction of travel. I think it so happened the two working examples I gave in my brief talk tended to be about the the use of you know a syst systematic use of big data sets. Um, but there are potential possibilities to aid the diagnostic pathway as well. So yes to all, really. Question here in the front. Hello. Um, I'm one of the clinicians. Um, I, speaking from personal point of view, um, actually, uh, we in the hematology department, um, we maintain our own database um, in the last 30 years. Um, we have about 30,000 patients uh, on the list. Um, the way we use our database uh, is a, a number of fold. Um, we use it for um, service development purposes to help us guide you know, uh, putting resources. Um, we use it to look at our performance, how the patients are doing. Um, and actually, we are looking to set, set up a new database because the old one is, is so old now. Um, from my point of view, there are certain things that I would like to achieve. Um, from, from the database, um, clearly I'll be happy to liaise with you guys and work together <coughs> to uh, set a common goals. Um, so, you know, uh, one of the things we find difficult would be, yes, we are clinicians, we are not so up to speed with our IT skills, um, and actually we have limited time. Um, you know, we are doing this, um, uh, in our own time, often we uh, uh, <coughs> do it um, out of hours. Um, so certainly we would appreciate um, some collaboration. Um, and um, <coughs> we would like to be able to link like different database, I'll say our database to say the treatment data. We, we use different programs and personally I find it very clunky. Um, it would be good to be able to link our database to say the mortality um, outcomes or you know, the treatment they get. And we also have a large number of people with pre-malignant condition and um, we would like to be able to see you know, over time what happened to them. Do they develop cancer? Do they do well? Do they not? So yes, the various things that we hope to be able to achieve very happy to talk to anyone afterwards. Thank you. I'd just like to make a follow-up comment. Thank you for that contribution. Because of the clunkiness of the way that we have used data, as, as I said, when the IHDP was set up, um, we went around and visited the five cancer centres. We didn't actually hear anything we didn't expect to hear. But as evidence of the requirement to get adequate resolutions for this, the evidence we saw was the workarounds that have been created. So what you've described is so common that a lot of clinicians and even managers have created workarounds to get the information in a format that they couldn't get any other way. And um, we can even take it before that. I set up the screening programme for breast screening in Scotland and I used to keep notebooks of my patients so that at the end of the year, when I was given a report in which I had no confidence, I could check it with my manually kept data. And of course, mine was accurate because it was my, my notebook. So what we are trying to do is recognizing the time constraints on you as a clinician is to say nowadays, all this data, most of this data is already there in a digital format. So rather than you have an additional database which gives us a headache, because going to Cancer Registry, for example, and saying to David Brewster, who was the previous director, I've got this great data set. You know, trying to establish how you could tap into that to the Cancer Registry is, is really difficult within the NHS. What we want to be able to say is, you've created that because you're not getting the information you need 
So we need solutions to use the data that's already there digitally, the treatment data, the survival data, all of that. We may have to go back into primary care to get you know, risk factors to inform, you know, to, to look at prevention and so on. But we want to start using that digitally held data in a way that is timely for you. You have it when you need it, where you need it, and in a format. That, could you imagine your life without maintaining your manual database? You know, that would free up a lot of time, wouldn't it? Is there a question in the front? Your description earlier on about what he's describing, you know, what we're looking at, we've actively been looking at a product development set, which was what questions would you want to ask so you yep. can see the results? Yep. Because we could provide that. And it's really, you're the clinician, we're the techies. So how can we help you get those questions set? And literally just listed four that we're going to help you. Yep. And there's going to be a set. So when you went through, is there a listing of work around that we could maybe work with as we're doing our approach to see if we can assist with some of those? Is, is that like well, we can certainly help with that. We can okay. share share the the outputs of those visits to the cancer centres, which wasn't a comprehensive. It was very unstructured. We got as many people as possible in the room, representing every discipline and the managers, uh, and so on, and just listened to what they had to tell us. Do you have an ongoing communication now for feedback as you're going through to check in with them and see if they have an? You're um, doing the annual meeting. Is that the annual meeting that you're doing? Well, the no, the annual meeting is a clinical meeting. It's basically saying. We've got all the breast cancer teams in Scotland saying, here's our 14 QPIs, how are we doing, guys? How are we doing? Oh, Dundee, you're not doing so well there. Oh, but you're doing really great in this other, how do you achieve it? You know, and so on. And actually, we review the standards. So every three years, we have another review of the standards, say, are these the right standards? Are these still the meaningful ones that you need to know? Everybody's achieving standard one consistently. We're going to stop measuring that as an ad hoc thing because everybody that's now been operationalized that's now the standard of care let's now move into a new world and say what's the next standard we need to start focusing on um, so there are mechanisms of recognizing where there are gaps which we can help you with thanks is there any more questions Okay, thank you very much for this. Steph, what happens next? Uh, well, now it's the kind of very informal part of the uh, day where uh, there will be referrals coming up and object, um, and uh, people can network. Uh, on the agenda, it kind of explains what your coloured spots are, but I don't know if it might be useful if I just call up each colour and everyone kind of stand up so you can know what everyone looks like. So, uh, Blue is an interested applicant and a commercial organisation. So if you could please stand up so everyone can see who the commercial organisations are. Um, Red is an interested applicant who's a clinical person. I think I did, I did do some red. <laughs> yes. uh, green is an interested applicant academic. Uh, interested academics. Perfect. Uh, and then orange is an interested collide, so commercial organizations looking to collide with uh, clinical and, and uh, academics. Um, and uh, yellow is interested collide clinical, so clinical people want to collide with commercial organizations. And like I said, we have a couple of more positions uh, who are wanting to come today that could make it, so I'll see the details. Um, pink is interested collide academic. I think I did stick some pink. But we do have uh, eight like people how many variants are there? <laughs> and, uh, and purple is others, i.e. the speakers and uh, and people that will be involved in the review process. So you can't have them. <laughs> you can talk to them, but you can't. Uh, so um, yeah, and that uh, brings to the end of the live stream because obviously it's no fun for someone to remotely watch people talking. Uh, so thank you for joining us on the live stream. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll find out where the refreshments are, but please network away and talk to all the relevant people you need to. If there's any questions about the uh, call itself, please feel free to ask me. And uh, we'll make <coughs> the slides from today available as well. And I'll also, oh, well, what do you send around the mailing list of everyone that's here? So we've got Is everyone happy to do that? Is everyone happy for me to circulate your contact details for everyone else in here? Yeah. 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 Brilliant. Fantastic. So Super. Is anybody not happy? Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> 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 this is your opt-out moment.
Fantastic, brilliant. So uh, let me go find out where our drinks and stuff are. And uh, thank you very much, Dave. Thank you to our speakers and our panel. And uh, I hope there's lots of interesting collaborations. She's never said that to me. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic.